G. Michael Hopf is here in the building. Well, he's not in the building with me. He's in his building. I'm in the bu building at Big Daddy Guns. I hope you guys have your big girl panties on because we're talking the post-apocalypse tonight with Arthur G. Michael Hopf. There he goes. Hey, how you doing? You know, he, he writes the, uh, the scary post-apocalyptic stories. G. Michael Hopf is going to be our guest tonight. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so it's post-apocalyptic sans zombies, so no zombies. No zombies. Zombie. I know, we, you know, apocalyptic authors that are out there nowadays kind of have to differentiate that. When we say apocalypse, I get people like, oh, so you write about zombies? Somehow zombies and apocalyptic fiction are like now married together. Right, yeah. And everyone instantly thinks Walking Dead and must have a zombie in it. And I'm like, no, so you always have to kind of have an asterisk next to it now. And go, no, 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 it's more rea reality-based apocalypse. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to talk about yeah. that because, and we're going to talk about the nuances of the apocalypse, post-apocalypse, zombies, <laughs> all that. We're going to talk politics, whatever you guys want to talk about. I want to thank everyone for joining us right now. Um, you know, we've got a bunch of people hanging out in the chat. So thanks everyone in the chat. Thanks everyone joining us. I want to remind you guys right at the top of the show here, please click the thumbs up button. Okay. And share this video with your friends and family on social media. Let people out there know that we're doing this. Let folks know that we've got G Michael Hopf on the show tonight. Um, the first thing before I, I want to do some shout outs to everyone that's hanging out with us, but first thing I want to establish here, what should I be calling you, sir? Should I call you G, Michael, Mr. Hopf? That not Mr. Hopf. Oh God, no. Oh, just, just Michael. Michael's great. Michael's great. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So, all right, Michael. So I'm going to shout out the folks in the chat. I know you were in the chat a second ago. So if you guys have questions for Michael, please let us know what the questions are. He's also in the chat. He he may, if we get a chance here be able to answer you guys. Lola's not here yet, so we're going to be a little disorganized until she gets here. Let me shout out everyone that's here. Meredith's Mayhem was the first one in the chat, so shout out to you. And uh, let's see, Chris B also in the chat. Foxtrot Echo joining us live today. Tango Hunter, uh, Chris Bullis, Imposter, Greg98K, uh, The Archangel, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, Shout out to all you guys. Uh, let me see. I'm going down, going down. Let's see. The Tyvin Show. The Tyvin Show is also here. Dan Davis, Kentucky Firearms Network. There's like so many. It's just scrolling by me. Uh, David G, uh, Bernard P, Rock Humper. These are these are some interesting names. In case you, uh, in case you don't, you know, in case you're not used to this. Dan Nugent <laughs> is also here. Uh, let me see. And uh, Dan Davis, I think I mentioned Dan Davis. We've got lots of folks in the chat. If I didn't mention you, just uh, do a roll call, shout out to me, and I will come back around and uh, I, will, I will try to shout you out. Also, let us know if you have questions or what you guys want to talk about. I see Little Linus uh, 001 is in here, Gerald Weldon. So what's up to all you guys? And uh, like I said at the top of this, make sure you click the thumbs up button, share this video with family and friends. If you're not subscribed to us, make sure you are. And of course, in the description is uh, G. Michael Hops, your your dot com, right? Yep. Yeah. So is that the best way for folks to get in touch with you, or what other stuff do you have? That is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, just you know, just to, to email me is the best way, or social media as well. You know, there's a Facebook dot com backslash G yeah. Michael Hoff uh, or yeah. my email at Jeff at G Michael Hoff dot com is definitely okay. the best. And Lola, it, Lola just got here and she's uh, chastising me because I, she, I, the P is silent. Lola says, apparently. So you could have corrected me, Michael. <laughs> Get it right, a, man. It's okay. No. Okay. So Hoff, Hoff, Hoff. Hoff. Yeah. Hoff. Okay. There you go. G. Michael Hoff. Okay, so you said that um, you were saying that the dot com's good, but you've, you've also got some social media, right? Yeah, Facebook. I, I stay pretty active with uh, my fans on Facebook. Um, if you message me or you know make a post on Facebook, I, I reply to it. I try to make sure that I'm, I stay pretty engaged with my readers. Yeah. Is Facebook the favorite social media for author dudes? I found it 
to be the best. It's again, it's just uh, easier for me to communicate better. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Twitter at all. Okay, um, uh, but you are. You do have a Twitter. I do, but I just never. I'm barely ever on it. I just yeah. God, you know, you and I were talking early and kind of the pre interview stuff is just so many social media stuff out there now it's hard to keep track of everything yeah so I, prim I primarily focus on Facebook and then Instagram um, Twitter again is a distant third yeah um so you know what the thing is it's like Twitter has the limitations right well okay. then they just lift those they just lifted Did those they? I think yeah, like 208 I think they doubled the number of characters you can Still use. Still not enough. If you run your mouth like I do, <laughs> you know, you want to put a whole dissertation in there, it's probably not enough. And then so, go ahead. Well, what I found funny is like Twitter just seems to be, I mean, I know social media has a lot of hate in it already. Right. But like Twitter's like, it's like, every, like everyone on there is just spewing hate. It's just like, it's like the hate social media site. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not a fan of it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's... All these things, uh, they keep changing around. I notice Twitter has flipped over now to the high school kids and college kids. So if you remember years ago, Twitter was for the old dudes. <laughs> now it's switched to the younger guys. And I think in high yeah. school and college, they do it because it's an easier way for the teachers to communicate with everyone. So if you're following a teacher, they could just put out everything or the school. So my kids, in, uh, I've got one that's still in high school and one graduated and went on to college, and they use Twitter a lot. So that's probably a sign that we should not be on it. <laughs> <laughs> or they definitely don't want you yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm on it anyway. <laughs> you know, and then uh, so and then Instagram, you do have an Instagram, but you're you're not a big fan of that either. Okay. No, I do. I mean I use it, but you know it's funny, I kinda primarily use Instagram to kind of see what my friends are up to and things like that. Yeah, see how so, awesome uh, their lives are. Or, yeah, because mine is horrible. Yeah, or, mine is, mine or is we're all fronting, we're all pretending like our lives are <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You know, what kind of filters are my friends using today on their pictures? <laughs> yeah. So it's very cool. So you know, you guys can get in touch, but your favorite one is is uh, Facebook, right? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh oh, did we lose you? Did you mute? Uh oh. Looks like he froze. So let's give him a second. He's probably going to have to sign out. I don't know whether or not he could hear us. So he's going to probably have to sign out and sign back in. Um, Lola, we lost we lost uh, Michael here for a second. So if you can, just uh, text him and tell him to sign out and sign back in. Yeah. Someone hit a wrong button here in the Internet or... The government, the government is definitely monitoring and does not want us to have a smooth conversation with G. Michael Hoff today. But we but we will get him back in here. Yeah. Um, okay. Looks like he's coming back in. Oh, there we go. I'm not sure what happened there. That was uh, Yeah, strange. I don't know either. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> I told you. I said you just froze. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, don't forget to put back on your lower third. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on the lower third. <laughs> Remember what we were saying behind the scenes? The yeah. government's oh, I know. monitoring, man. Uh, I was trying to get Michael on, and there was something weird going on with the email. So, yeah, we were having a tough time getting you on here. We got a bunch of questions and things like that coming through, which I'm going to go to. All right, I think so, here we go. Yeah, so Lola wants me, she wants me to cover your background first, uh, you know, like, Lola's got rules, so I guess a little bit of the bio. Um, yeah, so I, um, I started out my, my early life uh, with six years in the Marine Corps, uh, I was an infantryman, and um, I, I've kind of, now, now that I've become a, 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 an author, I'm kind of, I'm living proof to, that grunts can actually put enough words, string enough words together to form sentences. And that even though as us as Marines, we like crayons, we don't have to necessarily write with them all the time. We like to eat them. We just don't like, you know, we don't have to write with them. There's, that's, a, that's a joke with jarheads, you know, we like yeah. to eat, we're crayon eaters and window lickers. But uh, so uh, six years in the Marines and then um, after that, I uh, got my fill of that. After that, I became a commercial diver for a couple of years. And then after a couple of years of doing that, I was a, a, an executive protection agent uh, oh, nice. working. Yeah. So working Saudi, working like protection details. Oh, so like bodyguard stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like the yeah. movie bodyguard. 
it's, it was not as it's sexy not like as that. that. And there yeah. was no Whitney Houston's or anything no, like that. Okay, no, okay, I was about no. to say, man. <laughs> you know, tell us then, some that stories. Would great, that would have been a great gig then, but now. Yeah. So uh, what kind of so what kind of people were you bodyguarding? It was mainly uh, corporate executives and like uh, government dignitaries and things like that. My, my first detail, I worked the Saudi royal family. It was oh. like the third wife of King Fahad at the time. This is back in the 90s. Wow. And okay. um, I was just, just standing door. I was just at a post for 12 hours, like standing at a door for 12 hours. It wasn't yeah. glamorous. It wasn't working principal. So I wasn't actually work. I wasn't with the protectee. Um, but it was it was still fun. It, it paid really well. It was a, it was a cool gig, especially when you're out like hanging out trying to pick up girls. Like, what do you do? I'm a bodyguard. You know? so, yeah. Well, it's, was it, was, it easy it was, to pick up body uh, <laughs> to, to pick up girls in Saudi Arabia? Or were you here? Was that when? Well, no, they here. Were, no, that was when they actually came in the country. When they here? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is but, sexy. You could say you're yeah. Because uh, over so there, was, I don't know what that sense that would make. <laughs> It was uh, it was a cool gig. I did that for about ten years, and then um, I, I met a woman who is now my wonderful wife. And then we packed up our wares and moved to Idaho and lived in Idaho for about seven years. We opened up a ski resort up there. Oh, cool! And yeah, and so I was just kind of dabbling in different jobs up there, and then um, came back to California and uh, decided one day I was going to write a book. And I, the first one I wrote was The End, um, and it took off. Right. And ever since then, I've just been writing full time. This sounds a lot like a Marine to me. You know, <laughs> the dudes that I know that are Marines, they jump around, do a lot of different things. They're not afraid to to go into lots of different things. So, well, I think life is, you know, if if you want to do something in life, just go do it. I mean, there's so many limit. I mean, why put a limitation on yourself? I mean, life itself will present you with obstacles. Why should you have your own limited belief systems be an obstacle in your life? Like, you know, screw it. Just Go for it. And that's kind of how I always lived my life. Like if I, I thought if I thought something was kind of cool or I had an ex, or it, it excited me and I, I just would go try it. Yeah. Commercial diver for a couple of years. It was a good, it was a fun job. It was a very physical job. Does not pay what people say it pays. I'll tell you that right now. You know, yeah. so, all this talk. I mean, of, what is that? Like what were you diving for? Treasure? <laughs> oh no. I was, I, was, I was working, I was working, I went to commercial diving school in Houston, Texas. And oh, then that's like uh, welding, was, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just like yeah. underwater construction work. So yeah. I did about six months working offshore and then the balance of that, the balance of those two years working inland for American inland divers. And that was primarily working off the dams, working in rivers and that kind of stuff. Work, you know, working on, yeah. you know, foundations of bridges and stuff like that. Just really tough, really physical work. Yeah. Didn't you gotta have much skills to weld on the water. Oh, I thought that would be like that would pay a lot of money. Nope. Well, you start out in the industry, you start out as a tender. And a tender is essentially kind of like always like the the analogy, if that's the right word, is it's kind of like a squire to a knight. And you know, so you, so you already you already had like lead divers or your master divers that were there, and you were kind of essentially holding their hose and taking oh. care of all their gear. I mean, that's essentially what you did until you, even though you went to school and were trained, you once you it was more of kind of on the job training as far as to become a real diver before they make put you in and you know, before you got wet. Um, so I did around, was it nine months as a tender? And then they broke me out as a junior diver and I was making a whopping $12 an hour. Wow. Okay. There's a lot of, I know <laughs> don't everyone rushed down no, to Texas I, right now. I thought that was, I don't know. <laughs> I always thought that was a lot of money, but there's a whole bunch of things in there. Like there's a bunch of things that the people who are watching this are going to unpack out of it. So you went from holding the hose underwater to like holding off the hose as a bodyguard. Oh yeah. So the, um, yeah. what, yeah. So I, what, actually I almost got killed as a, I, I was doing a job in the Trinity river and I almost got killed. I almost got sucked into this 30 inch, 36 inch pipe. Wow. And that's okay. just a long story. I don't want to get into it, but it was after that. I was making 12 bucks an hour and I, I remember getting back on the barge and I was like, that's not enough money. <laughs> now I was like, and then I had this opportunity to go interview for a company called Vance International. Um, it was started by a guy named Chuck Vance, former Secret Service guy, and um, so I had a chance to interview and be a part of their protection detail, their EP, you know, EP division. And this again, this was back in the was it, was it late late nineties, and I went and interviewed, and then got the job. Went to a training academy up in Northern Virginia, and next thing you know, I was uh, my first detail was out in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills for the Saudi royal family. It was like the number three wife of uh, King Fahad at the time. Oh, okay. Very nice. So, you, I, I hope the yeah. bodyguard thing paid like we all believe it should be paying. I think I was making the time like $185 a day. And then, you know, everything was, you get a per diem and your housing was all taken care of. 
So we were like on that detour for like 45 days straight. So you work every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was like 185 a day. Hmm. Okay. That's and then and that's that, that's in the nineties. Like, in the nineties. Yeah, and then you're also and then once you once you move up to like you know protection detail like protect you like working the actual protectee that's war money detail leader working the command post those are all kind of I mean I was working like the basic grunt yeah, job yeah. the entry, entry level job is yeah. literally standing standing post at a door yeah for twelve hours. I'm guessing it's all better than uh, working at McDonald's. Except, well, I don't know. The diving thing doesn't sound like it was better than working at McDonald's. Actually, it was still a fun. It was a fun gig, though. I mean, I won't. I won't. It was a fun gig. It was. A, it was just very hard. It was physically yeah. hard. It was a physically uh, tough job. And just when the opportunity for the EP thing came up, I just I jumped on it. And when I got it, then I just quit diving. So yeah, um, the Tyven Show wants to know. I think you said you went to Houston Diving School. I went to the Ocean Corporation. Okay, okay. He wants it was in Houston. It's it's in Houston, Texas. Yeah, the Ocean Corporation. Yeah, he wanted to know. Uh, he says, did he go through Dan Patty? I don't know if that means anything to you, or if that if, if he's on there. I'm, is he on? Is he on like YouTube? Because yeah, it was, it's it's the open. It's the Ocean Corporation. Is what I went to. I was in the class of nineteen. The first class of like nineteen ninety five. I was that right? Yeah, ninety five. No, oh, okay. All right. So, so you can you can. Uh, it's like the, 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 the school is located in like Southwest Texas. I mean Southwest Houston. Right. So. So you said what? What did you say the first book was? Oh, the first book that I ever it was called The End. I actually have it. The here. End. Okay. So the first book was The End. Yeah. Let's show that. Yeah. Okay. And so, what inspired you to write this book? How did you? You know, I know you touched on it a little bit, but how did you get into writing? Well, I'd always dabbled in writing all my life. Um, even in the Marine Corps, I kind of dabbled. I made a lot of journals and kind of wrote about my experiences and whatnot. And then um, I've always been a big reader of sci-fi and horror, uh, and especially apocalyptic type fiction. I've always liked those kind of stories. Mm -hmm. And there was something I was wanting to see in the books that I couldn't find. And because I'd kind of dabbled in writing, and just because I just get these weird, crazy ideas in my head, ask my wife, I just said, you know, I'm just going to write my own book. And um, what was funny is before that, just before that, I kind of dabbled in the, the publishing of something as I had written a children's book, a children's illustrated book. I know it sounds totally night and day from, yeah. from what I really do full time <laughs> no, But now. that's cool, yeah. But, what, but what, the, what the children's book taught me is that I could actually come up with the idea and it goes from concept, idea, concept, all the way to actually holding something in my hand. And then, so w once I had that book on my hand, I was like, shit, I can actually do this. This is just, I can actually... Now, if I made the book instead of 678 words, if I made it 70,000 words, I've got a novel. So this is something yeah. I can do. And so I set about writing it. But before I told my wife this is what I wanted to do, I hammered out because I knew I know my wife really well. I uh, I wrote I wrote a couple chapters first, and then when I mentioned it to her, she kind of did the old eye roll, like, oh, "Okay, <laughs> sounds like my wife." Another eye. Well, she's idea. in the same yeah, place as Lolo. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, there again. we go again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I was like, "Wait, hold on, a timeout." I said, "I've got two chapters. Read these. What do you think?" And she, you know, she gave me the time. She sat down. She read them. She's like, "Wow, those are those are really good." You can keep writing. Like, give me a permission. I got my permission slip. It was amazing. You oh, can keep writing, but you're not going to quit your job. Oh. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so you wrote the kids' books. Did you? Was that because you had kids at the time, or do you? you yeah, know? yeah, so, so, yeah. So I have I have two daughters, and then I I would just sit down at night and read to them, and then I just thought it was just a fun idea. I was like, why don't I just come up? I mean, you know, children's illustrated books. Are, I mean, there's not much there as far as mm -hmm. you know the storyline goes. It's pretty basic stuff. So yeah. I just thought I could write something. It's more of like a legacy for them. They still think it's the best thing. Every every year, in they're in elementary school. I go there. I read the books of their class. They think it's the best thing. Dad's there reading to the kids and all that. Yeah. It's just it's just a fun thing. It's more of a legacy. Um, no, I think that's awesome, man. Yeah, you know, we were talk we were talking behind the scenes. I mean. I, I consider myself a storyteller. I always tell people I'm an artist, a storyteller, and all those kinds of things. Before, like, I, I am a gun guy. I've always been into guns, but that's what I always wanted to do. And obviously, I got sidetracked into a whole bunch of different things. But uh, writing, and the reason why I like to have authors come on the show and talk about it, for me personally, selfishly, I'm very interested in, in actually getting to the point one day where I publish some stuff. Because I've been writing since I was about five years old. 
Wow. So, wow. Then you, you should, you know, it, there's th with all the different platforms out there for self publishing and that I, I always encourage people to go that route. That's where I started. Why, why would someone not right now? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. Amazon specifically has really created platforms for, for would be authors to actually get their ideas, their creative ideas, their words out to the world. I, I there's never been a better time right now to be a writer. Yeah, absolutely. So if you wanted to do it, it's just to do it now and then, you know, consult with me and, you know, you, I know you know Chris and consult yeah. with us about kind of, you know, putting a team together because I think that's what's important um, because you need support elements. And that, that what I mean by that is like editors, proofers, yeah. uh, put a team of like beta readers together as well as getting graphic people to make sure the cover's right. No one's, no one who knows how to format the books because all those things are critical to the final product that's the book. But the main, the main chunk, you don't have to, and the thing is, don't worry about any of that shit. Writing the book first, then you go. Then you can worry about all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's uh, great advice. Write it. Yeah, I need to, I, I need to do that. You know, originally, because um, what happened with uh, my wife Lola and I is, I actually years ago when we got together, she was in college, and so I was working, and I and um, she was working too, but and going to school and. Basically, financially, I helped her finish college, and then I was going to get into writing, and I was going to do movies and all this awesome stuff. And I got Crohn's, or I found out I had Crohn's, and uh, then I got kind of sidetracked. And then we had kids, and then I became like a stay-at-home dad. And uh, and I was still writing during all this time. I just never finished anything. And then when I got into the gun thing, I decided to start sharing my experiences and everything with guns, my journey online with folks and that's how we wind up you know we, uh, i wind up here but that's like one of those demons that lives inside of me you know the the thing of wanting to tell stories you know it, it just keeps uh it just it's always in the back of my mind and i'm always thinking about it so i'm always making notes and writing down story ideas and things like that and yeah i guess i just have to get out there and do it you know well, i you know I, I suggest just do it and one one little piece of advice i always give people and that is once you, once you, once you set about, once you make the goal that you're going to do it, don't ever stop until you're done. Okay. And that is, I, I found the biggest obstacle to to writers in order to complete the novel they're trying to write is they stop. They'll stop. They'll write a paragraph or they'll write a chapter. Then they go back and reread it and they start editing it. Oh. And then you yeah. get caught. I call this. It's like a crazy eight. I, they they get caught in. They they start editing and they start hyper analyzing it and getting all worked up and I swear it's it's like a left left brain right brain thing. Writing is the creative part. When you're writing, you're kind of in a creative mindset and information and, and the stories coming out of you. Editing is like more technical, and so it's a different side of the brain I think. And you you don't think differently. And it, I've seen so many writers stop writing their book because they get caught in that crazy eight of yeah. I they keep hyper analyzing that 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 chapter or that paragraph and they can't move past it and then they get frustrated and then they stop. So if you, if, if there's one piece of advice is that just start right, just write the story. Don't worry about all the editing. Don't worry about all the mistakes because you're making mistakes. It's a rough draft. Don't yeah. worry about all that. Just okay. write until you're done because, and then when you're done, celebrate that day because you've actually written a novel. So don't worry about if you it's put, boring because you always think like this is probably boring. Yeah, see, what you're doing is you think it's boring. Yeah. And there could be other people. There might be, but there could. But that's also where an editor comes into play. It, it's sometimes is are you is it really boring or are you being hypercritical of yourself, or do you have belief systems that are operating that? that you have a self doubt that if you put this out there, that's what people are going to judge you on. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the thing, I think everyone has a story. And I think if you've been doing it that long, I think you should just truly explore it. You don't want to live life. I don't live. I don't believe in living life with, with regrets. You know, God gave us one life, just do it, you know? And yeah. again, just write it all over till it's done because then the heavy lifting comes after that. One, you'll have the confidence that you've actually completed the book. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's completed the draft. That's, that's a big part. The editing is another big heavy lift and you have to go back you'll read through and you'll start self-editing and then you get your editor involved and that's the, and you got to get an editor by the way that's critical and then once your editor is involved they're kind of i wouldn't call them a like collaborator but they're definitely a partner in the process and they're going to take whatever you've written and really polish it up and make it perfect so when you're independent well I don't, are you independent or are you signed to a publishing to a publishing uh, house I'm, I'm a hybrid now. Um, okay. So I've got four books with Penguin Random House, and the primary, all my books that come out now are all independently published. Okay. I make, I, it's because I just make more money 
as an independent writer. Right. I've already got an established fan base, and um, I've essentially whatever Penguin was doing, I've just duplicated it. You know, and everyone I have in my team are just contract people that are contract editors, proofers, you know, formatters. These are people that just contract. So I go out and find good people that know how to do all the same things that Penguin was providing, and I just pay them. Oh, okay. That's so that's what yeah. I was going to say. Like, how do you find an editor? Is it impossible unless you have a publishing house, or they're just good no. folks out there that are good at editing? There, there are good folks right. out there that are that are school trained, that are uh, have degrees in editing or degrees in creative writing that know how to that know how to edit, that know just how stories should be done, and uh, just find them. And I always recommend just referrals. I'm a big okay. referral guy. Instead of going okay. and finding someone you don't know, just ask other authors. Mm -hmm. You know, and and there and I find I find it's just best to, if you need something, just ask somebody that's in, that's in that space, and they'll give you a good referral. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm kind of excited but, um, by being amongst different authors. Now, you mentioned Chris. We were talking about Chris Weatherman, who's Angry American, right? And you guys mm -hmm. did you guys did uh, Hope together? Yeah. It was go. a collaboration we did, yeah. Yeah. So for folks out there that know Angry American, uh, you, you you also know uh, G. Michael Hoff. There you go. Hope is uh, one of the things you guys did together. So with the first book, uh, what I think we were talking before we got sidetracked. So what was your inspiration? What uh, made you decide to write the end? Um, there was two things. I was reading. I was reading one book. Uh, it was called. It was called One Second After. It's become kind of a modern classic in kind of the apocalyptic genre. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading that. I never. I never completed it. I was started reading it. it was a, it's a good book. William Forshine's a great, great author. It's, and it, again, it truly deserves all the praise it gets. It's an amazing book for the parts I read and everything I've heard about it uh, after that. Because when I was when I was reading it again, I wasn't again. I was stuck at that point. I wasn't finding necessarily. The, the storylines that I wanted to see, and so that's where then I just I decided to just go and write my own. So I had closed that book. So I didn't want to be, um, for lack of a better word, polluted from his, his what he was writing about, or his like, or kind of I didn't want to subconsciously take his storyline. And I just set about writing uh, writing the end. And in the end, where it differs from say one second after. Um, is that it's more you're getting a more kind of a global perspective of what's happening after an EMP is detonated. Okay. It's more than one EMP. There's an EMP over North America. There's an EMP over the Far East. An EMP over Western Europe. And so, it's, so these EMP attacks uh, essentially shut down the modern world as we know it mm -hmm. and our Western civilization. And but instead of just focusing on just a family that's sitting in a city somewhere or a suburb somewhere and how they're dealing with it. I, I had them, I had kind of what was happening in the halls of government okay. as kind of a point of view character. And also the main character's brother, who's a Marine. Okay. And because the one thing I've always thought that was missing in a, something I wanted to, I wanted to talk about is what happens to the military mm -hmm. when everything is falling apart and then their loyalties and obligations are challenged. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. What, what do they do? And, you know, being that I was a Marine for six years, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, and this is something I've often found. The civilian population thinks that the military is kind of very monolithic in thinking, mm -hmm. and that we're all pretty much the same way, and we think the same way, and we act the same way. We share common values, but we're all very much just like everybody else. That we have our own belief systems, or we, yeah. we view this, we dislike, we like this, or we hate this. But we're all pretty much individuals in a lot of ways. But again, we have that that common belief, and we we love our country, and we want to protect the values and protect what that is. But if posed with a situation where our families truly threatened on the home front, and we're being told we need to go a thousand miles away from that, yeah, what now are we we've got do a situation. Now? Yeah. Exactly, and, and we've not we've not been, you know, the military hasn't necessarily had that kind of situation happen since like the American Civil War or even the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. And whenever you had people's home fronts under threat, you had people getting up and leaving, like I'm out, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my family's down in Georgia or whatever. I'm heading yeah. home. Didn't that happen in because, Louisiana with uh, Katrina? I mean, it wasn't yeah, the military. Yeah, a certain. But. Yeah, no, no, and that's something too. I, I pose in there. There's a certain percentage of law enforcement officers, and this doesn't go. This isn't say a bad thing about them. They're just their loyalties are now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the reality. Too. Like you have daughters, you know. Yeah. I, I have I have sons. I will drop everything. <laughs> You know, I, well, now, yeah, what would I do in the military if I have this commitment and I took this oath and all that? It's kind of a different thing, right? But it's but weird. It's, it's, yeah. still, it's still challenging. It, it, it creates a conundrum for people. Like, what do you do? 
Mm -hmm. You know, you you know that the entire United States is, you know, CONUS has been, you know, the, the grid is shut down. And because the grid is shut down, all these other cascading failures have occurred. And so, and civil unrest is breaking out everywhere. And because of the EMP, a lot of EMS services can't come online. So law mm -hmm. enforcement isn't necessarily there. But, but basically the entire situation is so large that society is breaking apart right there. And, and there's a power vacuum. And it, what happens in power vacuums is you, you tend to have people move in and fill that void. And they can be good people or they can be bad people. Right. And if you're sitting there, if you're a Marine or you're a soldier and you're like, you're told to go over here to do something that you know at home, your wife or your kids are could directly under threat. Yeah. So I posed a situation. I wanted to see how people reacted. And I got some interesting reactions because I have a military unit that this brother was in and they leave Afghanistan, they get back on ships and they're heading back and they're being told to head to Washington DC to do a recovery effort and half of the half of them mutiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that it just causes all kinds of chaos. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's so much stuff there. So what kind of reaction did you get from folks uh, out of that? It was a mix. It was funny is that most of the military guys, specifically Marines, were fine with it. It was the non-military people that tend to have heartburn over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you you painted Marines as a bunch of traitors. And now I was like, well, if they're not traitors. And yes, like I because I, I asked we I, we'd have these conversations when I was in the Marine Corps, and even mm -hmm. all the, the jobs I've done. I, I still know a lot of Marines. I mean, they're yeah. still in and I know Marines that are out and, and soldiers and airmen and, and sailors and whatnot. But when you, when you sit around in circles and talk to them, like, what would you truly do? Yeah, well, like, how does everything rank? Yeah, what yeah. what ranks? You know, I'm assuming for me, as, as just a regular, normal guy, it's going to be my family. You know, family, friends, community, you know, where do these things rank, right? And then also, is there a contract that you have when you go into the military that the government says, hey, we will take care of your people? Well, I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of, uh, that's implied that we, we, you know, the military deploys, uh, to faraway lands to, you know, and that we're, we're fighting, we're fighting in these foreign theaters to defend the homeland, but the homeland is under threat. And again, in the scenario I pose, you know, the, the grid is down across the nation. You know, can't, total chaos is breaking out everywhere. Um, you know, roving bands of marauders and just people are out just, you know, causing mayhem. What do you do? Yeah. And your family's now we're not talking theoretically threat. They're truly under threat. Uh, uh, so again, again, elite, your allegiance is now you're torn. What do you do? Do you, do you go and help a stranger a thousand miles away or do you go back and help your family? Mm -hmm. I, I pose that I have, and that's why I, I like to have controversial things happen in the books because mm -hmm. I want people to think. I want people to like ponder through these situations and people say, well, that would never happen. Like, okay, I yeah, can tell you all kinds of, of situations. Yeah. <laughs> people always say think that's never happened until then it happens. And they're like, well, now we're dealing. Okay, now it's happened. Now yeah. we're yeah. Uh, so. Someone like Trump will never be president. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a year ago, right? That was like yeah. a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. How's, how's that looking right now? Okay. Let me ask you one quick question. We've got a bunch of questions there. Uh, I'm going to ask you one thing and then I'm going to go to the questions. I just want to remind everyone that's watching, uh, click the thumbs up and share this video, please, with your family and friends so that uh, other folks know that we're doing this. We really appreciate you clicking the thumbs up there. Okay. Um, the thing I was going to say to you is the, the threat of an EMP. Is that the scariest thing? Because I noticed lots of people uh, incorporate that as the premise into their books. So I, I think that it's, it's a, it's a, it definitely is a scary situation for me. Actually, I think a pandemic is actually more frightening to me because it's something I can't see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think pandemics are more frightening personally. And I think in some ways could be more probable. Um, I think the, the, can an EMP occur? Yes. It takes, it would take a nation state, or a rogue state that's got some backing by a nation state to pull off that kind of an attack. It's a pretty dynamic attack. Cause essentially you're taking a nuclear warhead and you're making sure it's positioned in the high atmosphere or low earth orbit, even going that high and detonating it. Um, it takes, that takes some sophistication in order to pull that off. Right. Um, not, not to say there just, we don't have enemies out there that, that could do that. Um, I know North Korea is really big in the news right now. And from, you know, people I talk to and sources I have, we clearly know they have nuclear weapons. 
the issue that they're, they're they have right now is the ability to deliver it there. Um, and again, and you know, once they get that delivery system, it only needs they only need one. Yeah, absolutely. And That's if, it. If they if they get that thing, and you know, but still, we have we have anti missile systems. We have abilities to countermeasure that. But still, you know, is it? I mean, does I mean EMP? You know, the use of EMP was part of kind of the you know during the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It was part of our doctrine with for, with first strike. Mm -hmm. We would, you know, essentially, you know, hit the Soviet Union with EMPs, and they also have the same kind of uh, measures against us in first strike. Hit us with, hit us with EMPs, and then start to pepper the cities and all the military installations with nukes. Yeah. So, the, so the EMP is definitely a part of a protocol uh, by, you know, the, again, the former, you know, us as a superpower in the Soviet Union back then. And can the Soviet, can the Russia do it? Yeah. Can China do it? Can these other nations? Yes. Can North Korea? I don't think they're quite there yet, but they're definitely on their way, and they're definitely yeah. working toward it. They probably Not wish they could. They probably wish they could because that would cause enough uh, trouble. And I think that's oh, yeah. the whole thing about all of this, right? Even if you have uh, some kind of virus or whatever that gets out there, if you still have air conditioning and you can still get on the internet and all that stuff, uh, I think people will be able to get through it. But if you if you lose electricity and if you lose all these gadgets that we've become accustomed to. That's a, that I think that's why folks are doing it, right? It's a really scary thought. It, it, it's it, what's what's interesting about the, uh, the grid down scenario is that it's um, it's all the the apocalypse essentially comes about is because people can't work together, yeah. And everyone will just tear at each other. You know, you'll have the grocery stores emptied out within a day, yeah. You know, and, and any and any grocery store that's out there only carries up to maybe three days of a food supply anyway. Mm -hmm. And those those will be cleaned out once once yet so so in 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 the chance that one is detonated and it's over conus and it, it does substantial damage to the grid and the grid once the grid goes down then you have all these cascading other failures that occur right um, even if you had automobiles even if you had you know that's always a controversial thing will will my car work mm -hmm. well you know here's the thing there's been a lot of testing out there there's no concrete. Thing that's ever says that every single modern automobile will stop working that's all theoretical um it's also you look you have to understand emp it's like where is it detonated i mean i'm talking like like where over the united states how hot what at what at what altitude is it um and also where's your vehicle parked are you on the open road driving it is your vehicle vehicle parked in an underground garage because mm -hmm. it's not a it's not universal this so it's not like if it was detonated over 300 miles above Nebraska, if your car is sitting out in a field in Iowa and it's a modern automobile, it's probably going to have some damage if it's running. Mm -hmm. And it could be catastrophic damage to the automobile or it could just be kind of glitchy. If you're like have a car in San Diego in an underground parking garage, right. it might have enough, it might, it's far enough away, but also it might have enough protection that it might be a little glitchy, but it'll actually start up again. It just some of the features of a modern automobile may not work. But the big problem I tell everybody is that's great. And what everyone gets so caught up about, will my car work? There's more guess stuff. What's not work. But, but guess what's not going to work? What? Gas stations. Are yeah, work. gas stations. That's because when the grid's down, that is universal. Well, you might have a car that is operational, even if it is a modern automobile. Great, pull into that gas station. Guess what? Electricity powers the powers the pumps that gets that gas out of it. Yeah. So great, you've got a car that works, but you're only pretty much going to have the gas that's in your tank. Yeah, and and I know people worry about people worry about their small devices and things like that. Like, well, what about my phone? I'm like, yeah. What, what internet do you think is going to exist? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I, I, the, the biggest things we have to fear is the grid down. Once the grid goes down, again, there's all these cascading failures that go along with it. The food supplies stops, right? So food supply stops to this and water supplies, so water pretty much stops. The cities you'll see the first major effects. Like if you live in any kind, if you live, if your apartment is above the ground floor, you're out of water instantly. Mm -hmm. Because it takes pumps to pump up. Mm -hmm. So if you live in any kind of apartment building, you're out of water day, like second one, you're out. And so you start, and then the suburbs are affected next because suburbs have more than likely municipal water districts have big, huge you know, mammoth tanks that are positioned. It's all gravity feed stuff. Um, so you'll have a water for a period of time and then eventually it dries out. Yeah. And yeah. so now you're out of food and then water goes next. And then what do you have? Yeah. I mean, that, that, so 
And then I know people that live in the country think they're, think they're going to be insulated, but the only thing I can tell people living in the country is like, you know how many people live in the cities? Guess what? They're going to be your neighbors pretty soon because you're going to have massive migration. It's going to leave the cities and leave the suburbs heading to the country looking for food. Yeah. That will be the zombie apocalypse. That could be the zombie yeah. apocalypse. Zombies or whether they're <laughs> zombies or not. Okay, so let's uh, let's take this question from Martin Jones. He says, Poco Poc <laughs> what am I talking about? Post-apocalyptic water purification. What is the best way to clean the water after it's been chemically contaminated? So what do you, you know? There, that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I always think just like boiling stuff if you can is a is a really sound thing. Um, if you, if you can do that, it's always the best way. It is to boil the water down. Mm -hmm. Boil it. Yeah, that's um, you know that's a good place to start. You know, there are there are also some you know chemical uh, there are I mean commercial filters that are out there that you mm -hmm. can kind of run stuff to as well. Um, so you can look look at look at those as well. Um, but you know sometimes just the basic stuff that we learn uh, you know just boiling the water, capturing it, you know condensation from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Water is water is going to be a big thing, man. Water, you know, what's the, the you know the big threes, right? Was it you can three? Was it three minutes without air? Was it three days without water and three weeks without food? But water is the big deal. Yeah, absolutely, water I think so. And without all this crazy stuff happening, water is a big deal in a lot of places. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, um, and, 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 the, and the also the other, the other problem with this EMP or grid down scenario is just that you know we go back to a we we are transported as a society back to kind of a 19th century way of life or mean or because there's no electricity for the most part um, but we don't have skill sets that we um, that we have so that that's the main thing is the lack of skill sets okay yeah absolutely okay i've got some shout outs space dread says we should tell you that uh, he loves your books and uh, he has been a fan for years so Thanks, that's man. what yeah, um, you know, that's from Space Dread. So, and let me go through some other stuff. Uh, uh, Mike Benjamin, shout out to him. He says he really likes the show. Okay, let's see. Uh, MW Tacticals also in here, shout out. Gerald Weldon. Okay, let me see who's got a question. Um, okay, Rock Humper says the P is silent unless it's winter. <laughs> Either. Winter is coming. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Oh, I see a Game of Thrones fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess. So you know what's funny? Speaking of Game of Thrones, I met um, I met George Martin at uh, a Penguin Random House party at Comic Con a couple of years ago when I went and I spoke oh, cool. at Comic Con. Okay. And uh, I had this opportunity. He was like, "There was a line of people," and I was drunk at the time, and I was like, "I'm going to talk to this motherfucker." So I'm whatever. <laughs> I pushed my way past all these people. I just sat down. I was like, "Hey, George, how you doing? I'm G. Michael Hoff." And he was, "Hey, yeah. how you doing?" Yeah. And he had like that little. Silly hat. hat he wears. Yeah. Like, Where's that? I don't. Know. He had had that on that night. Yeah. And I was. Uh, I, I told him about my stuff, and then and then he was. You know, we kind of bantered back and forth a little bit. And I said, "You got some, Yes. Did you have any advice?" And I said, "I'm a, I'm kind of a new author. I've been writing for a couple. It was a couple years at the time." And he goes, "Just expect that all the success you're having now is it kind of ebbs and flows, ups and downs." That was his advice. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. It, that little hat reminds me of. Uh, he reminds me of L. Ron Hubbard with that little hat. I don't know why. I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. What was that about? The I hat? said he. Re he reminds me of L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> oh yeah, God. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I see that hat, that's what I don't know. I, that's what I think about. So you know, L. L. Ron Hubbard was also a very prolific writer. But, yeah, uh, you know, I think George Martin is probably, uh, you know, he's a lot better. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, no, the stories are the stories are good. You know, I think yeah. HBO's done a decent job of adaptation as well. So. Yeah, don't think we're not going to get a religion out of George R. R. Martin stories. <laughs> there will be people, you know, to the cult of winter and all kinds of other things, you know. Um, yeah, so. But that's cool. So what were you, you um, how'd you wind up at Comic-Con? That's that's a cool thing. I I was invited to go speak on a panel about horror or the art of the art of fear was what oh, okay. it was called. So they picked, I guess, apocalyptic fiction falls under, uh, uh, it's like a subgenre of horror. Oh, and okay. so they had um, a, a panel of all of us on there at someone who's writing zombie apocalypse, someone that wrote kind of um, like traditional horror, you know, kind of Stephen Kingish kind of stuff. And then um, someone who wrote some pandemic stuff. So there's a, there was about eight of us on this panel. We were just talking about kind of, 
um, our writing, our books, how, how horror is, has kind of changed over the decades from what it used to be to what it is now. And it was, it was fun. It was really cool. But it was a really cool experience for me to actually be, not just go and visit Comic-Con, but actually be a part of it and sitting in the room there and talk in front of like a thousand people was actually pretty cool. Yeah, no, that is pretty cool. And uh, have any of your books been optioned yet? For, I've, like, I've, TV had, I've, or I've movies? had the end optioned, and then the option expired and never went past that. I've had um, had lots of talks on stuff, um, but you know, nothing is. It's tough to get things adapted. There's a lot of money involved in making in making movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's different ways of doing it now. I, I was in big talks last year with a guy that used to be a producer for Fox Searchlight. And we actually got as far as, you know, looking at preliminary casting locations and things oh, like wow. that for my, okay. book, for my book, for my book, Nemesis mm -hmm. Inception, which is a spinoff of the New World series. Mm -hmm. And um, it got to the point where we were looking at for, for capital. And then that's where everything started falling apart. Um, yeah. I started asking some harder questions of him, this producer, and that's when he started becoming more aloof. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good thing that you that, that you asked those questions yeah. and pushed them away. Well, well, it was a thing. You know, he's trying to get me to go out there and try to hunt down, you know, some big money, and I can I can I can find the money if I need to, but I need to make sure other thing other things are lined up. I'm mm -hmm. just I'm not I'm not going to go out and start hitting up people for money unless we have some kind of a. I wanted a business plan drafted. I wanted to be able to tell any investor what kind of re expected return, you know, and yeah. he. No, he just didn't want to do that. So no, you, you want to see it happen. I mean, if you talk to George um, R. R. Martin, I'm sure you'll find out that he, you know he just didn't drop into getting Games of Thrones out there. You know? I mean, no, no. These things again, they're, they're not easy, and it takes. Yeah. You know, there is there's a lot of availability out there. I've had you know, it was a bad robot approach me. Uh, oh, okay. A little. Yeah, not they that make, long ago. Yeah, they make yeah. movies and stuff like that, right? Because I think they do yeah. the Star Trek stuff now. That's it's JJ Abrams company. Yeah. yeah so I had, I had yeah. somebody from them approach me and asked me about the, the option that the rights for the end. And I told them they were available again. Um, so they've they're again, I've had lots of people asking, I've had an option once for a year. Again, they never exercise those rights and here we are. Yeah. We'll see, you know, hopefully, hopefully it happens. It's, ne it's never an easy process. Um, so here's a comment from Joseph Yates. <laughs> this is uh, this is probably a good segue into other stuff. He says, "Hi guys, I've, I have a serious problem. My gun has has been sitting on the table loaded for three hours and hasn't killed anyone yet. Should I take it back and get my money back?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's that's pretty much how it works. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh God! It doesn't do it doesn't do bad stuff on its own. <laughs> um, I don't know if you have a comment on that. No, I you know I did, all this stuff is just all this gun control talk is just silly nonsense. I've been hearing it all my life. Um, it's stupid. Yeah. Well, I know that the Democrats, of <laughs> course, you know they're always putting uh, gun control forward. I know that's in the news right now. The Democrats put in uh, Congress put forward. Uh, oh yeah, Diane Feinstein put something out. Yeah, yeah, some big kind of assault weapons, or it's probably going to be another assault weapons ban they're trying to push through. So um, good luck with that. But we still have to fight. We have to make sure we are contacting our representatives without a doubt. We can't let just hope that um, our our representatives will do what we want them to do because a lot of them tend to want to roll over. They want to, they want to be liked by the media. And I don't, I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's like the media, the mainstream media is never going to like you. So who, who cares? Yeah. Who just, gives a crap just, about them? Yeah. You should be caring about whether what you're the constituents that put you in office, what they care about, not the media, not what people think about you as some black tie cocktail party in Washington, DC. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we were talking about this off air. That's why I was like, I think, yeah, we need to hurry up and get on air because there's so many things that kill people in the world and they're not trying to stop any of that. Well, because there's an agenda that's behind it. I mean, just like we were talking, you know, before, before the show started and that is I've always, I've, and I always put this out there to people. It's, 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 it's not as if they care that people died, how they died. You never know. And that's why I always, I always pose that to people when they get, you could literally have it. You could have something on the news that says, you know, thirty thousand kids a year die from swimming. You won't have this outrage and this people, you know, raging on Twitter and the media going losing their shit over stuff because mm -hmm. they don't really necessarily care. There's just more yeah. of an agenda behind it than the actual 
genuine need to 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 make sure people don't die. I, I, I still I don't believe that they truly care. They just use it as a vehicle to drive an agenda for it. That's it. Yeah, I mean. No matter That's how it. you want to slice and dice it, there's uh, over a thousand human lives that are destroyed every day to abortion. Regardless of what you believe about abortion or whatever, that's human life destroyed. Nobody, that's babies. That's uh, that's not some oh, no, serious it, person's babies. Oh, and, and isn't, it, isn't it funny how the, how life is defined, right? If on Mars we find a single cell amoeba, yeah, that's we've got life. to save the planet. Yeah, we've got to save yeah. Mars. It, 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 on the yeah. Earth, we'll, we'll, we'll kill a child. Yeah, a yeah, human yeah. life. Yeah, someone's yeah. sperm meets egg makes life. No, you could totally destroy that. You don't have to think twice about it. We're not terrible that a thousand, a thousand lives are destroyed by by that every day. Well, you, you know what? It's always things always come down to intent for me, and um, you know, on on that issue specifically, it's it's things are about intent. And you know, if a woman is if a woman is asked a situation, you know, like why are you doing that? It's never like it's my choice. I mean, because that's not really. It's not. Are they choosing to do something? Yes, but why are they doing it? Once the intent is laid out, then therefore you then establish life. Because the fact is, the matter is, is when you you keep asking the question over and over again, why are you why are you having the abortion? Why it why is it why do you want to do it? It's because they don't want to have a baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah, that's there, it. there, and then lies. There, and then lies the reality. They, they are. They know what's happening. They are terminating a life. Mm -hmm. It says it yeah. right there. Absolutely. They're not making. They're not. They're not exercising a choice like whether I go left or right, or whether you know, I, you do any number of things. Whether I get the vanilla or the chocolate, that's not the choice that's at play. Mm -hmm. So it's not. It's not as simple a, as as a choice. It's the intent is to rid themselves of the burden of responsibility of having a child. Yeah, absolutely. I I, uh, I agree with that. So, you know, I mean, this this is, you know, this is something that's going to keep going on. I think I agree with you. We just need to stay vigilant and keep up the pressure because I think even the politicians that we think are on our side are just waiting for us to let up. You know, know. And, and when they think we're not watching, they'll try to push something through. So, you know, um, that's something we definitely definitely have to keep uh, pushing here. OK, so let me um, hit some other questions that are coming in here. Uh, so collaborating with other writers, how does that? So I know you did the first book and um, that I'm assuming that was successful. Then you started doing other books. How did you get into the collaboration thing? So it was just, you know, I met, um, you know, me and Chris it was funny. Me and Chris have never uh, actually physically met. We've just talked, you know, tons of no. times on the phones and. No, we've actually never phys you know we've never actually physically shook hands before, but um, we've just done he's a lot a of very, conversations. He's a very very handsome guy. I, know. I know he looks just very very sexy. sexy. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when he watches this, he's gonna where, be so mad. Where, where is this going? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So you've um, never okay because I know when I told you that I know Chris, he was here yesterday. I was talking. Well, you should have had him on. We should, we should do like. A, yeah. I was going to say. I was going to say one thing, but that would sound really bad. I was like we should have a three-way. That would sound really. <laughs> <horrible. God. laughs> okay, you could do that, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to be involved. <laughs> no, we should. It'd be fun to have us all on at one time if you could do that. Yes, really absolutely. Cool. We yeah. should have a round table and talk about stuff, yeah. you know, and talk with folks. Yeah, yeah. that'd be a good idea. We can make that happen. Okay, um, but uh, so he and I were, you know, he and I were picked up. Uh, he was picked up by Penguin a little bit before I was, and then I got picked up by Penguin Random House as well. And then we kind of were kind of had this shared journey with that mainstream publishing house, Penguin Random House. Mm -hmm. It was this interesting journey in itself. And then um, we've just stayed in communication for a long time. And then I had the idea for the collaboration, and I presented it to him, and that's for that book, Hope. And oh, okay. I went from there. Oh, okay, cool. And, and, and Chris was super easy to work with, so. And yeah. I hope I hope I was so. Oh no, he says uh, you're, you're like his best buddy. That's what he told me. And you know the thing of the people. If, I mean, obviously, people if they watch my channel, they know what Chris looks like. He does not look like a nerd, but he's totally a nerd. Oh, he's pretty wonkyish. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's he's an incredibly bright guy. He knows yeah. his stuff, man. He knows yeah. his stuff. He knows the ins and outs of a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's why. But you know, what's great is that's why it comes out in his books, and that's why he's got such a great following, is because he not only can write well, but he puts in those technical details that few people do, and he he just does it. He's it's a perfect blending of of great creative storytelling and blending in technical stuff. He does a he does a really good job. I've I've really not found anyone else who can do that.
No, absolutely. And all and a lot of stuff that he puts in his books, because I quiz him on it all the time since I have like access. So I'll read a book and then I'll go, yeah, you put this in your book. Is that true? And I'll ask him questions. We tease him because he has, I think he should write a book about this. He has a thousand and one uses for wood ash. I don't know if you know this. I didn't. I, I don't, really? Yeah, he's got all these uses for wood ash. I didn't even know you could do all this crap with wood ash. But, you know, as a survivalist guy, he knows everything. I didn't even know what wood ash was, man. Why a why thousand and one? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> you know, he's probably got more uses than that for wood ash. But he's just always like, yeah, you could do, you know, I think if you're poisoned, you can use wood ash. <laughs> you know, you could use wood ash to preserve. He's like, uh, what's the name of the character in uh, Forrest Gump? <laughs> That, remember the the guy that oh, knows about the shrimp? Uh, uh, yeah. Bubba, Bubba, yeah. Bubba Gump? Yeah, yeah. He's like oh, Bubba. Bubba Wood Ash. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I don't want to start something because now when you talk to him, you're gonna start harassing him, and he's gonna blame that on me probably. Well, we, I like I I told him his beard keeps growing. I was like, you know, I think your beard is creating its own personality. Like you're gonna have like <laughs> he should have his own social media page just for his beard. Just for the yeah. Yeah, that beard is amazing. So, um, okay, the armed Kentuckian wants to know what's your post-apocalyptic loadout. And I'm sure you, a lot of things you put in the book, you've like tested this, the practicality of it. Your books are very uh, realistic. That's what I like about it. So, yeah, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to like the firearms, I know I, I hear about that a lot. I like to, I like to you know use firearms specifically calibers that are NATO rounds, and it's mainly just because of kind of the availability that's out there. When it comes to like nine millimeter or 45 ACP, you're pretty much going to find that stuff anywhere. I know, and and this come and then when it comes to rifle rounds, I'm I'm more you know five five six seven six two. Um, again, more of the everything's everything's NATO. So um, and it's again, it's more about availability. I know people will will, will want to stockpile stuff, but the the problem with stockpiling is that you may not you might be in a situ, you might be somewhere that you lose or you lose your stockpile, you lose your cache of stuff. Yeah, how easy so is it to carry 10,000 rounds with you? And you might have to bug out and you may not be able to do all that. But if so, if you're out there, if you've got some kind of an exotic round, you know, if you're carrying like a 10 millimeter, you know, you know, if you're carrying a 40 caliber, again, you can find them, but there's going to be a lot more availability for nine millimeter, even 45 ACP. Yeah. Uh, than some more of these, to more than more exotic rounds. So um, what's your? What's I, your I'm, a big, I'm a big. I'm a big. I'm sorry. No, that? go ahead. I'm a big. I'm a big Sig guy. Even up until they, up until the latest debacle with Sig. <laughs> <laughs> which which debacle are you uh, referring to, Michael? <laughs> All I know is when I drop a... my Sigs, they don't fire. So. <laughs> oh. oh, do you bang them with hammers on the back? Because that's what. <laughs> That's what you have to do now. <laughs> but I, I, I've been told, I've been told my my fixation with Sig has to end, and I need to become part of the Glock family. So I I, I keep being oh. told that by my fans and readers, like I need to I need to switch over to Glock. So I'm actually I'm look so I'm looking at getting a Glock 19 now. Okay, uh, Glock 19. Yeah, that's a pretty popular one. You look, I don't think you have to do that. If you can rely on your Sig, then there's nothing. You know, if that's your thing, then that's your thing. I think what happens. Like I always tell people who don't like the grip angle of a Glock, they probably well, that's, that's one, yeah. That's one thing I've always had an issue with. You know, it's that whole back, the grip angle, the kind of when I'm holding it, the back strap, it just doesn't feel ergonomically natural for me. Yeah, that's why I've always liked your, the back. Your sig. hand was maimed by the Sig. The Sig, basically, you should we should start a class action lawsuit against Sig <laughs> because they maimed your hand, and now your hand can't fit into the grip angle of anything else. <laughs> Well, I feel like when I'm holding this the, the, the Glock, it's it's like my wrist is up. I, it's just again, it's just me. It's probably because I'm crippled. But um, yes, yeah. I yes. just I've I've, no. I've always liked I've just always liked just how Sig. You know, I I when I was a bodyguard down in Florida, I used to carry a Sig two thirty nine. Right. It's their it's their compact nine millimeter. Uh, would they still make they still make them? But um, and I still have that same one. It's it works like a charm. It's you know great small small framed you know semi auto. I love it. Uh, hit it's accurate, but um, yeah, I, I'm thinking of moving now to the to getting a Glock 19 and, and joining joining the the horde. Are you gonna be okay? You're gonna um, need like some kind of join, join the collective. Yeah, twelve step, <laughs> twelve steps to get to uh, weaning off of safe. I, I remember I was talking with uh, Jake from Leviathan. Right. Oh, 
right? And by the way, hey, Jake. Yeah, we um, got to shout out Jake, man. I can't believe we're into this hangout. We didn't shout him out. Yeah, and uh, he was like, yeah, so I want to get one of, your, one of your Glocks and we can get him over and do all this. Yeah, and I was like, I, I don't have a Glock yet. And he was like, what? <laughs> he looked up at me like, how dare you? I was like, I got shitload of things. I mean, he was like, it was just, it was hilarious. Yeah, so basically he's like, yeah, just go. I know, I'm not going to apostate. I'm an apostate. Yeah. You know, I don't have uh, So don't what have are you ashamed? Yet, so. are, you, are you embarrassed to go into the gun store? <laughs> like, oh, I want, listen, can I tell you something? When you go to get that Glock 19, you need to see if they have a high point. Okay. You know what that right. is, right? I just heard a ding. Did, did, did you do it on purpose? No, no. That was I think that was Lola's cell phone or something. Because the way you said it is, you got to get a high point. Ding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now you know what high points are, right? You know about high yeah. points. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you so have any? You don't. Do you have one? No. Yeah. Just for the experience. <laughs> I think everyone should have at least one high point. You're you're yeah. a big you're a big. Well, though, so what, no, what are your no, thoughts I'm not, on? I'm not a big high point fan. I mean, I'm a fan of guns. Okay. So, it, like, I look at yeah. guns the same way I look at uh, cars and women. I like all guns, all cars, all women. So, <laughs> you know, I think that you should. Now, obviously, I'm married, <laughs> so I can't go out there and experiment with the different flavors. You know, when it comes to the. Uh, the the females but you can't you can't experiment with all the different kinds of guns and and cars and things like that so yeah you know one thing I, i'm still a big fan of and i, I guess maybe some little old school is i'm still a fan of revolvers in certain circumstances um i know when i lived up in the midwest upper midwest years ago i used to carry a hammerless you know it was a thing of six uh um, not a, i mean a smith and wesson uh was it 639 i think it was hammerless um yeah, and, I don't know a lot about revolvers. You just said revolvers yeah. in my brain. Part of my brain. I know, I know. I know everyone just goes, <laughs> No, there's lots of guys. We're going to get hate now because there are lots of people that like revolvers. <laughs> You're not the only one. So. Well, what I liked about them was when I was, when I was up there and having an overcoat, because I, you know, it gets cold in the upper Midwest, and so I'm carrying this big overcoat. I could just have this, that, small, that small little J-frame kind of just sitting in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I could be holding it. I could shoot through my coat yeah. if someone approached me. You know, so I know there's, again, this always brings in, everyone's got an opinion and everyone's going to start running for it right now. But, you know, I've always, I mean, again, I just grew up, I grew up shooting, you know, as a, as a, as a young kid. Um, my dad worked for um, the evil NRA at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I had, a, I mean, a big opportunity to do a lot of shooting was a field rep when I was growing up. So we actually, I, I grew up back in Maryland. We, had, we grew up on a big farm and we had, um, uh, my dad actually built a range on our, you know, on our farm. Oh, okay, so I shot cool. pretty much every day, hunted every day. So, but yeah. you know, he was big, big old school guy that when he was in law enforcement, he was like, he, he did a lot of competitive shooting and um, he, you know, he would do a lot of shooting with the, with the Smith and Wesson model 19 revolvers. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, that's what, that's what he used to carry as a state trooper back in Maryland. And so he used to, he was like a big shooter, he competitor. He was like in the governor's 20. This was like competition for a police officer. Okay. And, was a, and president's 100 and all that kind of stuff. So he was the one that really kind of introduced me to, to revolvers. And he just had a, he had a love affair with them. Yeah. I don't, now, think, he his, I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with revolvers except capacity, but it's a great yeah. like backup gun uh, that yeah. you can go to or okay. a gun that's on, you know, some side of your body if something happens to your main hand that you use, you know, you've got something to go to. I just think that, uh, you know, the capacity is not enough for me personally, but yeah, still get the job done. Yeah, no, I think that there's places for it. And I know that, you know, I, you know so it's, I've just, again, maybe it's more of a nostalgia thing for me. So I definitely have a few of yeah. those as well laying around. Yeah, and, and some of them are sexy. I mean, if you look at the Colt Python, that's a sexy gun. Right? I think I think all guns are sexy. I know I was yeah. looking at, I was looking at that Chris Vector and, oh. some, and, and somebody was like, "What the hell would you want that? I was like, because it just looks fun. Yeah, cool factor. Cool <laughs> yeah. factor. Now, no, was, we should also be able actually, to have full auto because that's what makes that, Chris Vector great. That? Well, I was gonna, I was going to say we should all be able to have full auto because that's what's the Chris, – the Chris Vector is its greatest at full auto and suppressed. So I, I, did, I just think they're – they just look cool. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's the sci-fi guy in me, but um, yeah. and, and as someone was asking me, I was like, why would you even have that? They, they, they were being like serious. And I was like, 
Why not? Yeah, it just looks but like that's fun. Like, yeah, that's I like asking. Wanted, so it's like a toy. It's like a toy. I mean, is it necessarily going to be my my go to when 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 shit hits the fan? No, but yeah, I you know I, I don't just have like three guns. So I mean, I just <laughs> you know I think first of all I think it is a cool gun. It does have the cool factor. But that's like someone saying, why would you want a Lamborghini? Well, because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> How about well, that? Yeah, if you can afford one. <laughs> yeah. <now it's... laughs> uh, I want a Lamborghini whether I can afford one or not. <laughs> <laughs> They're you expensive, know? bro. Yeah, I mean, it's listen, Can I? should I go back to the rule about the women, the guns? Because the... <laughs> you, if, you, if you're a dude, you can't afford them. I don't care how rich you are. You well, then, are you in the watches money. then? Are you in the watches as well? Um, I yeah, I do like watches, but uh, I had to like make a choice. So I used to collect like you know I was trying to build up and get watches and stuff like that. And then uh, Lolo was like, "Yeah, you can't have all these things that you're into. So you gotta you know you gotta slim it down to what you're into. Are you into watches? I, I like a nice watch. Yeah, yeah. You know, more yeah. than more than just like you know Rolex are great. I'm more like I like Panerai. Oh okay. Uh, I've got a few Panerai. I like Panerai. So oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think they look. It's like are the those, face are on. Those expensive. I've never. Now I'm gonna have to search. Now I'm gonna have to Google. Start that. searching. I think. I think you deserve one. Tell Lola he deserves one. Yeah. Okay. She'll hear that in about two minutes. <laughs> so how do you spell it? P A N A. Oh my God! You're asking me. P P A N E R A I. I think that's right. I think that's how you spell it. Okay. Panerai. Panerai. I gotta have to look it up because I never. I pull a Panerai GMT. Oh. With Panerai. the black face on it. Okay. GMT. Okay. Did it come up? Yeah. Yes. Oh, those look cool. Oh yeah, those are yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty sexy. I do like watches. I just don't. You know, um, I decided I want my watches to be lightweight, and I want them. I don't want to change batteries anymore. So like you nowadays, don't have to do that with, you don't have to do that with these Panerais. Oh, are they self winding? Yep. Okay. Very cool. I I decided to go with. I don't know if you could see this or not. Let me see if I can I get it out of the light and get it to focus. This is a, uh, let me see, that's probably better there. This is an Oceanus, so it's titanium. You know, that's from Casio, but it's like a high-end Casio that's titanium, solar-powered, and atomic. So it sets itself. I hate, you know, the, this silly thing we just went through with daylight savings? Yeah. That's a conspiracy, basically, to keep human beings confused. <laughs> Um, I, I don't have to deal with that. It just sets itself, and then I don't have to change the battery. And it's really lightweight. I can't feel it. So I, I want to ask anybody. Maybe somebody knows out there, and they can put in the chat room. What is the deal with daylight savings time? I'm like, I'm over it. Uh, um, isn't that? I don't understand it. I hear about. I hear when some people kind of explain it, but I'm just don't. Then why don't you just get up earlier? Or I don't. I don't. I don't, get, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know, man. I think didn't it have something to do with? Uh, Sailors? It's no, not that's, sailors. Not, that's sailors. Uh, farmers. Yeah, farmers. Yeah. Yeah. I think it had something to do with farmers. So the pan the Panerai is not bad. It's not you know it's a, it's close to like uh, Rolex money, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know that doesn't really matter. Yeah. So is that what you, what are you what watch are you wearing? Since I had to, I'm not actually wearing one right now. You know, it's you know I, I have I have to kind of admit when I got the text, but I, I got the text from you. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, I totally forgot. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I usually program these interviews. I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, so I was like scrambling. I, yeah. I just got done work I just got done working out and I did literally just threw this shirt on. I mean underneath I'm just got like shorts on. But um yeah, it was so funny. So I thanks. just Yeah, thanks for that uh, information. <laughs> <laughs> I could stand no. up and give you a fashion show. Oh, oh no, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know. We'll let the people decide. If the people want to see it. Oh god, like no, it. no, never mind. Forget that. I didn't put that out there. No. <laughs> no. Um, this is mostly dudes, Michael. So no. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if dudes want to see your junk. No, but, I know. Uh, and and these guys that are my fans are pretty raunchy, so they'll start asking for it just for the hell of it. You know, make we'll make it the thumbnail. No, I don't. You know what? That's that's not going <laughs> to help you sell any books. <laughs> no, it does not. Does not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. Before we got sidetracked, uh, I don't know how, before we got sidetracked into this, I was going to ask you, what's your favorite apocalyptic uh, round? My what favorite apocalypse? for the apocalypse. Yeah, what's, what do you think for, is the best? For rifle? I, you know, I'm a big 5.56, five, and then, you know, I think, I, I'm a, I like 45 caliber, but I think 9 millimeter would be for handgun. 
Okay. Again, I just it's it's just main it's just mainly for the, I, the availability of it because there's it, we're going to be a wash in that that those calibers just for the fact of military being on the streets in in a case of any kind of an event and law enforcement being on the street. It's just it's just our streets will be a wash in those in those calibers. Um, again, more so than your your more exotic. I use that term just because you just don't see a lot of 10 millimeters or 40 caliber. I mean, I know in the gun community, we, we see a lot of people who shoot a lot of different stuff, but I think when you, once you're looking at trying to find something and if you run out or you lose your stash or, and you're limited, you can, you can pretty much walk up, walk up to any military installation and that's what they're, what they're going to have any armory and things like that. That's going to be the calibers to go with. And, God forbid we're kind of invaded by some kind of UN force. Um, again, those are the calibers that are used worldwide for the most part. Yeah, so that's what you can get off the uh, the, the the people that you capture or whatever, yeah. right? Or um, what what will probably be left around? What do you think about twenty two? I mean, I've got a couple twenty two caliber rifles. Um, you know, I I mean, I I look at twenty twos as you know. You're talking about 22 long rifle stuff? I'm just, yeah. it's more fun for me. Yeah, it's more planking. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just curious, you know, it's lightweight. You can use it for hunting. And it's got, it's got defensive capabilities. Probably not the greatest thing up against body armor and things like that. But, you know, I wouldn't want to get shot by a 22 at all. I wouldn't want to get shot by a BB gun, but. I, I wouldn't want to get shot, period. But, yeah, um, yeah I, mean, I wouldn't want to get shot by a 22. Um, but I, I I don't I mean I probably rather get shot by a twenty two than say a forty five. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to parse, if you want to parse things. So what do you think about? I think someone's asking a question with shotguns. What do you think? Uh, you know what? Or what do you think about shotguns like twelve gauge, etc. Uh, thirty thirty out six. I love shotguns. About, okay. got, I, I've got I've got a I've got a uh, I've got a .30-06 rifle bolt action as well. And um, but shotguns I think are great. I like I th I love shotguns for home defense. Um, mm. uh, I think that they are very effective for home defense than say even handguns in a lot of, in a lot of ways and can limit sometimes collateral damage if you've got other people in rooms. Um, again, there's everyone's got an opinion on these things, but yeah, uh, I think, absolutely, I, you know. Yeah, I think yeah, I like I like shotguns. I like I know people are really big on you know I've got some friends who are all big on these their auto you know you know automatics and things like I I like I, I have my favorite shotgun is my Remington 870. Mm -hmm. Really, I love it. I okay. just lo I, yeah, I, lo I love the pump action. It's simple. If there's ever any issues, and and what I like about pump action too, it's like you can be kind of in a dark room and someone's in there. This the sound of the action is international sound for get the fuck out of here. Um, um, yeah, I, I, listen, I know I got a lot of guys say that and, uh, you know, I think to some extent, yes. Uh, I don't know if a crackhead's going to listen to that sound. <laughs> you know, I know if, I think if someone's overly, uh, hyped up to come after you, it may not stop them, but if you got some 12 gauge in there, oh yeah, <laughs> that goes yeah. behind that. Yeah. That's, uh, and you know, it, it's something that's overlooked too, is the power of a slug. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that is just. That's, you know, that's something I think most people are always talking about, you know, double odd buck and things like that. Um, but a, a slug, if you're trying, really trying to take some, I mean, that powerful, man. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, I'm that's, big, I'm, that's a, great I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of shotguns. Yeah, um, that's a, the awesome thing I think about shotguns. And then, like you said, pump action. I think a lot of times, look, I think what's sexy is the magazine fed. I think we all think the magazine fed shotguns are sexy, right? I know I do. I think they're sexy, but they don't always work. Right. Well, and that's the reliable. thing. I, 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 went, I remember that was it the second time I went hunting with my dad, and I had an eleven hundred, you know, and it jammed. Mm -hmm. I um, he shot the he shot one deer. I the deer. I think I was twelve years old. The deer was the deer was moving. I then shot one, and I hit him. I, it was. I, I'm telling a horrible story, but I didn't do the job I needed to do, and so I went mm -hmm. to go shoot him, and it was, and then it was uh it was sitting out the casing was sitting out of it so i and then i was oh. so panic as 12 year old and anyway so it was just it was just a shitty job and i've always been kind of against you know the the automatics because of that mm -hmm. and, yeah. and remington 1100s are great shotguns but when i needed it to work it didn't and again i was really young at the time i mean i can definitely troubleshoot stuff now with no problem mm -hmm. but i just i know there's, there's something there's 
pumps. I just like pumps. Again, maybe I maybe again I go back to like the old school stuff. I just like I like a pump. Yeah, well, you, you, know any gonna, you have any frog, the action you just keep keep going. Yeah, you know it's gonna work as long as you shuck it properly. <laughs> you know, as long as it's operated yeah. properly. But they can get rusty, they can go through a lot of things and still be functional or you can still clean them up. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think I agree with that. Uh, I'm a Mossberg guy myself when it comes to the. To well, the, Mossberg, uh, they make really good shotguns. I mean, they they yeah. they they've got a name for themselves there. You know, I thought they're not even made in Sweden anymore, are they? I mean, are they are they even headquartered there anymore? I know that's well, their Mossberg, whole heritage. Uh, yeah, their heritage is it's a Swedish company, wasn't it? Uh, Back in the day, that that could be that could be true. I don't know. That's a good thing. I mean, We're gonna have isn't, to isn't the emblem is that's the emblem is like the Swedish flag, isn't it? Um, you know what? Let's yes, I, I know what the emblem looks like. Let's uh let's uh let's Wikipedia Mossberg. There we go. I'm sure somebody else on here is much smarter than I am. Yeah, people so will be probably... telling us right now, you idiot. <laughs> this is what OF Mossberg and Sons, uh commonly known as Mossberg, American firearms manufacturer specializing in rifle scopes and firearms origins. Oh yeah, he well Frederick Oscar Frederick Mossberg was born September 1st, 1866 in Sweden. Got in the village they, of Svangsgogs. So so were they so were they never a Swedish company or were they just he just uses that as a like an ode to his heritage or something. Yeah, it looks like um well it says he was born in 1866 and emigrated to the United States in 1886. So yeah, like 20 years later he came to uh the US and that's probably where he started uh building everything. Got it. So it's it's so it is definitely an American company. There we go. Yeah, but that flag, pro, you know, goes back to the heritage and all that kind of stuff uh, um, of where he came from. So yeah, that's cool. You know what? I have seen that flag and I never thought about it till now. And then there's three crowns. That's some kind of Illuminati thing. The three crowns in the flag. Oh, like, is it? I don't. No, I don't know. I'm always trying <laughs> to start. Wait. I'm always starting trying to start like false rumors. Fake news. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. Great. Who, who knows? You know? You're that guy. Okay. Yeah. Something might catch on, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll be like the black, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Jones. Alex Jones. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'll be like. Is that is, is that is, is that what you aspiring to? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. And when I get to Alex Jones territory, yeah, that's the beginning <laughs> of the end. <laughs> but you know, listen. Sometimes, just like the Inquirer magazine, okay. Sometimes Alex Jones knows what he's talking about. Sometimes they get it right. Yeah, sometimes they get it right. Just like Inquirer magazine, right? You know, you know. There's it's it's even like you. You're a fiction writer, but there's some things that you you'll be. Has anything you've written about actually happened yet? You know, like where like you wrote about something, people are like, oh, that's so crazy. I'll never. And then something like that happened or similar. Obviously, no. we haven't had the. Uh, we EMP haven't had attack. an EMP or anything like that, yeah. But and then and then the, my book, and then my book that just came out in July was a Day of Reckoning. Yes, which I read that book. Here, hold that yeah. book up for a second. Uh, there you go. That's a pretty good book. I I read it on on audio, so I know that sounds weird, but I read it on. It was a, <laughs> no, audio is audio is a big. You know, it's a it's it's kind of where books are going. You know, I think you know I have this. I've been telling people I think in a couple generations from now, printed books will be gone. I mean, if everything stays like we are, we're kind of a still quote unquote advancing as a society. Um, I think the printed book will eventually go away. I, you know, I'm seeing it just. In, I think if you ask any author out there and and you look at your sales, their sales are broken down. You know. Electronic books are the biggest seller percentage wise, and then comes print version, like hardback, you know, trade paperback size, and that's what this is. And then um, and then audiobooks. But audiobooks keeps eating into the share of print. Oh really? Books. Okay. So audiobooks is Oh yeah, audio audio is growing every year. There and it's it's just because you have the development of just, you know, people's smartphones. They they're on the actual smartphone, they get into the car. Most people's modern automobiles have you know, and are enabled with Bluetooth, and you can stream right from your phone right to your car. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's just streaming, you know, audio is just, it's becoming really, really popular. Yeah, uh, it's convenient for me. You know, I don't really, the radio is just repetitive. And um, yeah. so if I'm driving, it's it's a cool thing to listen to. Even sometimes you're working out, working, all those kinds of things. It's a, it's a good thing to listen to an audiobook. Okay, Sally Taylor says Alex Jones, a bit over the top, but righter than wrong. 
So there you go. And uh, Bob Bluntman says, Alex Jones is just a humble water filter merchant. You should, yeah. Is that what Alex Jones is selling now, water filters? Okay, that could be true. I have no idea. The last time I checked, it was some kind of vitamin. So. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think I heard him talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. vitamins. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, okay, so let's see. What should, where should we go to now? Um, I think Lola wanted to, me to ask you who you would like to work with. Obviously, you worked with uh, Chris Weatherman. Have you worked with any other authors? Uh, no, I have not. Um, I mean, I, I talk with a lot of them almost on kind of a daily basis. You know, I usually chat with one author or another, you know, um, every day, uh, just either we help promote each other. And that's something we do kind of in our genre specifically. We, mm -hmm. we, we help each other. And I just don't, cause I don't think there's really a lot of competition in writing. I think it's not like we're selling a toaster. It's not like you only need one for the next yeah. 10 years. Right. You know, I mean, books are, books are consumable, right? So, and I've had readers, they read the books quickly. And so they want another one, but we can't provide it. I can't provide that kind of content that fast. So, I like to promote other people that I know have good works. So I, I do that. We all help each other that way. Yeah. And I, I find that I, I even like helping new authors get out because you never know who's going to be the next big thing. So right. okay. again, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not worried about competing with going up against anybody like that. I mean, I, I know what I put out is, you know, people like, I've got a fan base for it. I, again, I don't mind. I don't love helping other people. So. Yeah. It doesn't hurt me. And I think, um, you know, I think like you said that there's this, there's this thing happening now in, in our society where the media is really not catering to most of us. So they're either trying to program us or they're speaking to their own choir. But, but people who think like us, there's really nothing out there for us to uh, consume, right, in terms of media. You know, there's no good books. There's, no, there's not a lot of movies except for guys like you that are doing things, you know? And, and that's what I like about what you write. You know, listening, listening to um, Day of Reckoning, I was like, oh, this is written for me. This is something I can plug into. This is not an author who doesn't know about guns, who doesn't understand how they work, who doesn't understand why guns are so important, or is just trying to be cool and go along with the times and convince people of, of other things. I mean, you know, maybe you're speaking to the choir a little bit or preaching to the choir a little bit when you're doing it, but we need alternatives because what's out there in the mainstream media is so horrible. That's why a lot of us can't watch the news anymore. Oh, I, I don't watch the news anymore just because it's, it's, it's that. Even Fox News, I just I can't do it. It's just yeah. I find it annoying. I've actually found, I, I tuned it out a long time ago. I, I just I consume my my news just by reading it. You know, I jump on Drudge and I just kind of see what kind of I, I follow just so I kind of have an idea of yeah bigger picture of what's happening in the world. And I just touch on a certain things. And that's pretty much the end of it. But I found my stress level comes way down when I'm not involved with it it's not on in the house and I just rather be doing other stuff than be worrying about because they said when they talk about the same shit over and over and over again, it's like enough. And I, I just, I just, I don't know. I'm just done with it, but I'd like preaching. If you want to call it preaching the choir, I am fine with it. You know, I've, I've never classified myself as any kind of expert on anything. I have the experiences I've had growing up being a Marine, being an EP agent, all these things. I don't know everything. I just know what my, what I've done throughout my life. And if I can, leverage some of that and make some great entertainment for people that can appreciate that stuff that my, my job is complete. You know, yeah. I'm fulfilled that. Way. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mean um, it in a bad way. I just think that. No, I know. No, I know you don't. And yeah. I know you don't. And I, and I, when day of reckoning is very much catered to, um, kind of the, the sandbox, the people I'd want to play with kind of thing. Yeah. And you, as you, because you read it, you know that. Yeah. And I, I remember, uh, I was trying to market this to somebody and then I was like, well, I don't think this book's going to be necessarily a one thing you're going to want because I'm pretty pointed in I view the world. If you read that book, you're like, your listeners are going to, your, your people who watch your show or are familiar with you are going to yeah. love Day of Reckoning. It's absolutely. right up their alley. It's yeah, right up their alley. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Matter of fact, I, uh, Lola's telling me that she put a link um, to Amazon in the description of this book, The Day of Reckoning. I think it's a really good book. I, I think you should read it because it's kind of like what we're trying to tell people. I don't know. I don't know how you want to describe it. I don't want to do like spoilers or anything like that. But yeah, you know, it's it's kind of a mix of you know. It's funny about the origin of the of the book. It was actually two books, and 
that were I was writing kind of so I I write multiple books at one time. I know it sounds crazy, but I do. And um, it was kind of a, a, it's a mashup of two books, and that's why you've got the two different storylines between the military unit, mm -hmm. and then and, and then, then civilians, the, and the civilians, yeah, and with the, different, the, so the, with the different angles. Yeah, but they're yeah. essentially in terms of people that are listening or people that are watching. Uh, Day of Reckoning is it, it, it focuses on a a terrorist plot by a um, offshoot of ISIS that is trying to uh, destroy Western civilization. It is in a nutshell, and so there's definitely this plot as you're reading it. You'll be discovering this plot and how the plot is unfolding, not just with this uh, military unit that's put together to combat it. Um, one one part of the plot, but also the civilians are hand handling the things that are happening um, in the United States and in their and where where they live, you know, specifically. But, and uh, some uh, are causing it. I think we've got some different uh, perspectives. Well, yeah, that's where you know, and I definitely bring in. I wanted to write it where I bring in a lot of the news media. Now you remember that you hear about the news yeah. media report right. this. So right. there's a lot, a lot of people describe it like ripped from the headlines mm -hmm. and because it is, and that's just so funny. Someone was reading it right when the travel ban again was put down the third time. Was it mm -hmm. just recently? Um, and someone, someone yeah. messaged me. It's like, someone messaged me. He's like, Oh my God, you literally have that in the book. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's, and with, and with the Antifa types and those freaking savages and mm -hmm. I, you know, so there's all those types of people that are in, in the book. Um, they aren't listed as who we know that they are, but they're in the book. And um, so anyone that's concerned about terrorism, concerned about ISIS and Antifa, and I, I think that they're in bed together, by the way, without a doubt. Yeah. And they're being funded right. from people that are overseas, a lot of money coming from overseas to fund those groups so they can cause their mayhem. Um, it book touches on all that. Yeah, and I think uh, I think a lot of us realize this, but you know, we are in, inviting the wolves in you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're inviting the wolves in. We're, the people who want to destroy us, they're out there saying, "Yeah, go to these places, infiltrate, do damage." And they were like, "Yeah, come here, do damage." You know, and we're not trying to filter anyone. And uh, listen, I'm an immigrant. You know, I wasn't born in America. Came from outside of America. Um, knows what it is to come to America and go through all the things that it takes to uh, get a green card. Because I actually didn't. I didn't come to America with a green card. Um, you know and go through the whole process of getting that, becoming a citizen and everything. And it really, to me, it's like a privilege and it should be reserved for those people who want to enjoy freedom, not people who live someplace and maybe they don't like how, or they say they don't like how everything is. They want to come to America, but then they want to make America like the place they're running away from. You know, I don't believe in that. I was born in Guyana. I don't want America to be anything like Guyana. You know, so and, and I think that's what I think the book touches on that, right? That we're inviting in these people that want to destroy us. Yeah, and it's it's it it it's almost a it's some of it I think is deliberate because you I think there are people out there that want to destroy the United States, and in, because they want to build up something else in its place, but in order to do it, they need to have the current system destroyed. They can't just replace it. They need to utterly destroy yeah, it. They need to burn and, it down to ashes yeah, they, and like just yeah. you know, that's get why rid I of think the ashes. Yeah. Yeah. And and so part of that is is I believe is to dumb down the society through the as and from 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 the point that they are they attack our culture. And by the way, so there is a unique American culture. And what's beautiful about America is we are a culture that does embrace other cultures to come in as long as everyone wants to share in the one unique thing, and that is liberty. Right. We all want shared liberty together. We want it and liberty liberty in our market, free market system allows us to have prosperity, right? But everyone mm -hmm. needs to play by the rules. And that's why there's we're 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 a system of rule of law. Mm -hmm. And so we are very warm, and I, I hate these all these analogies. People saying that we're not we're anti-immigrant. That's not the case at all. We're, I think Americans and Americans in general are very warm, very America open, very the, inviting. Like I, I don't know why I don't. People have this twisted, okay? Because if you go, if you go to, for example, I used to live in Nigeria, and um, in the eighties, and um, 
you know, ne right next to Nigeria is Ghana. My, my wife Lola is actually from Ghana. And uh, th there was a time, I remember this happening actually several times, that Nigeria said every single Ghanaian has 48 hours to get the hell out of the country. And when this 48 hours expires, if we find you, we are kicking your ass, killing you, you know, whatever. You're getting, you're, you're going to leave this country, you know, in a body bag or, you know. And that happened. I remember that happening. I remember watching that happen, that they went and round up these people and like, you know, they killed people, beat people up, put people in jail and just kick people out of the country. You know, so when people think that like, um, you know, when people try to put America in this light of being this horrible, terrible place, you know, go to Mexico and try to get like some kind of health coverage. Go to yeah. Mexico and let well, something be wrong with you and see what happens. Well, I, I, th I think I th I, it's again, what's the argument that's being kind of tagged uh, with us? You know, from the you know, the left and the hardcore left is is only to kind of what they're trying to do is um, delegitimize our argument or de delegitimize what we have to say. And the, and and the thing is, I, most Americans, even those people that have that that come from kind of my spectrum and belief system, I'm very open to having all kinds of people coming to this nation, but they have to come the right way. They have to come here, and I think, and I'm actually, I've been support. I know Trump's now the biggest supporter of merit-based immigration. I've been, I've actually been a supporter of that for a long time. Not, not saying it has to be that way 100, percent but you know, we, we need to be doing, we need to be trying to to get the the best and brightest to come in here as well. Um, but I, I think there's a loss of focus on taking care of Americans right now, and I think that's why you had the results from Lily a year ago. Is there's a lot of American people. American born that are feeling disenfranchised mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, they think something's not right and people are awarded when they break the law and again it's not it's just like listen we have a system use the system that's what it's for yeah if you don't want to use the system I, then you don't get to come here you don't get to come yeah. and play in our sandbox when you don't go through the system it's very it's very simple and may, may, could there possibly be some reforms there maybe to uh, streamline it in some ways or i don't i you know i it, it, i don't like being characterized in a certain way and people are like well it's either one way or the highway but the only thing they're just trying to marginalize our thing you see it on the gun side all the time mm -hmm. you know it, you know one thing oh republicans and gun owners are all to blame for the shootings no, we're not. I love that it was a certified NRA instructor that shot that son of a bitch. Absolutely. You know, in Texas, yeah. that was amazing. That's what that we great. always talk about. And 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 he wasn't <laughs> no. even he wasn't even all the way prepared, right? You know, but he but he had, thank goodness, he had a rifle, he had ammo, he was able to grab ammo. He didn't have his magazines loaded, but you know, that's a whole other thing. But he was able to grab ammo and he had some kind of training and he could go after that guy. He had presence of mind, you know, he had someone else there that was willing. The uh, the guy that was driving was willing to step up and put his life at risk. And they were able to go after this guy because this guy would have probably went on to another church. Yeah. You, you know what this, you know, because we had the, the, the guy driving people down in lower Manhattan, you know, last mm -hmm. week and then the thing in Texas yeah. a week, a yeah. week later mm -hmm. with that. With, and, and that was in South South. Was that Southeast Texas that it happened? Uh, I'm South sure. Texas, right? Uh, anyway, I'm not sure yeah. what Southern yeah. is and I'm yeah. bad that way. I'm, I should know that. But, mm -hmm. um, but what that shows us, but you're looking at you look like most populated city to a very rural, rural area. Mm hmm attacks right yeah it, it shows just that people cannot live in and they cannot have a normalcy bias right now and people no. are like is this the new this, is this the new normal well unfortunately maybe that it is but here's the thing no one should no one should look this people should be prepared and, and that goes down i have these four things i think four things where i call the four pillars of survival and it comes down mindsets the biggest thing like you have to have the like you were talking the one guy was willing to get in the car and help him out you got to have the mindset to be able to when, when stuff happens to be able to step up and handle it. okay mm -hmm. secondly you have to have the ability and this is something that i think defies a lot of people and what i mean by ability is have a certain level of fitness a, a certain fitness level to be able to handle yourself mm -hmm. because you never know when something's gonna happen i mean if anyone's ever been in a fist fight before you know they end up more than likely on the ground and you're rolling around with somebody and you know how tiring that can be. Yeah, it so comes you have down to, to have the ability. Give up first. 
Oh, and that's what it is. And so mindset's a big thing. Ability I mean it's kind of it's kind of a fitness level. I'm not saying you have to be at six pack abs and look like the guy on the beach body. That it's nothing like that. But just the ability to like if you've got a bug out, you can throw your back your pack on and hump for ten miles, hump for mm -hmm. fifteen miles. Can you mm -hmm. handle your bug out pack? Um, then you know skill sets comes to play. That's kind of the third pillar. You got to have abilities. I'm not saying you have to be a master of everything, but you have to know certain basics and. Then the fourth thing is resources, and the when you look at resources, that comes out of food, water, you know, medical supplies, you know, firearms, ammunition, all these other things you'll kind of need, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you can go down the other stuff. That thing, I mean, the one thing that can be taken away though is resources. So you can, mm -hmm. if someone has the mindset, the ability, and skill sets to survive, they don't have to have resources. They can actually still survive. Those yeah. three things can't be taken away from you. Your resources can. So when people hear people are, are preparing or and they're, they've stockpiled a bunch of stuff, but yet they've never trained with their stuff or they've never gone out and they never put their pack on and humped with it, they don't maintain a certain level of you know of fitness and ability to handle themselves, or they don't train with their firearms. And it, it, just having stuff's not going to save the day. Yeah. If you never, if you don't you let your mind, to, I mean, those things are great. Yeah. But you could find yourself in an event. I think your signal is slowing down a little bit. Oh, did we? Okay, it looks like uh, it looks like he either froze up or we lost him again. So we're just gonna have to wait a second here, and uh, I'm sure he will sign out and then sign back in. Have I been missing any questions, Lola? I'm sure there's a bunch of questions at this time. Um, just as a reminder to you guys, we did put a link in the description to not only uh, Michael's main page but Amazon. So you guys can check out his stuff. Uh, he's also on Audible, so check him out there. And I think Lola will probably tell me to use this time to re remind everyone that um, we've got some new T-shirts on the Forge from Freedom Hank Strange collection. So you guys should go over to, to uh, Forge from Freedom. Look in the Hank Strange collection. We've got some really cool guns in there. I think you guys should check that out. Cool guns? Cool uh, oh, excuse me. You're selling no, guns? No, no. I, well... <laughs> I do sell guns, but I, no, we don't have any guns over there. We have shirts. We have shirts. Yeah, there you go. All right. So cool. I don't know what all happened. Right. All of a sudden, it just dropped again. That's crazy. Yeah. I'll fix this all again. I don't know what yeah. happened. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's cool. That's okay. They're watching us. <laughs> I'm telling you. Something's going on over there. Well, <laughs> you know what I was, what I was going to say to you while you're getting set up? I think, you know, you touched on this, and I, I want to expand on it. Why do people think this is nowadays or today that we are in danger and the world's at war? Because I remember in the late 70s, early 80s, living in England, you know, you had IRA bombings and all that kind of stuff going on. The yeah. world's always been at war. We've always been at war with each other. This never ends. Well, the, the, and we just haven't had a lot of things ever happen here. I mean, it's just not – it's not everyday things for people. They think people think they're insulated from it. I mean, I think a lot of people are trying to change their mind as you start seeing more and more of these kind of events occurring. There's almost a kind of like a quickening in some ways, right? You've got Vegas, you've got you know, New York, you've got Texas now, and these things seem to be happening on a more rapid scale. But they've been happening and for years. I mean, 9-11 oh, no, I'm, I'm, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, of course they have. But still people, mm -hmm. I think, live in this, a, what they call a normalcy bias, where they think it won't happen to them. And they think how their life has always been and how it is today will always be that way, and that they'll never be confronted with something like that. Um, and that's just not you – know, history shows that. And it's like you're saying, whether it's whether it's people living in London or during the, the all the IRA bombings back then and – uh, people living in Belfast when you know when the, when the tr British troops occupied it. I mean, to all I mean, look at look at the Balkans from historical perspective. Look at um, uh, Sarajevo. I mean, you had one year was it was it eight, the eighties, eighty four, eighty eight was the eighty eight Winter Olympics was held there. Uh, was it in Sarajevo? Was and it, then yeah. and then like with literally within five years, it's like it, the the stadium is a is a mass grave. Yeah. All within a very short period of time, you know, Yugoslavia falls apart. And then it goes to war with each other. And then you've got mass killings everywhere. Right. And again, if you were to go back, to, was it back to the Winter Olympics? You think, oh, everyone think life is great. Life is great in Sarajevo. And then again, less than five years, people are being shot at in the streets, killed. And the stadium is a mass grave. So 
things can turn around. I, I present that to people all the time, and they, I'm actually beyond the point of ever trying to convince anybody. Yeah, I, I well, just I, America. I, I I don't think I could deny that America had it maybe good for a long time, I, you know. But at the same time, America in its birth, uh, there's lots of growing pains and stuff like that that happened, oh, yeah. right? You know. But it's just maybe after World War II, America went through this boom. But you, you still had things that were happening. I think it comes down sometimes to personal things with people. Maybe not where, you know, maybe not where we see like, okay, 20, 20 people, 30 people, 100, 1,000, 2,000 people get killed at one time. But regardless of, of why or how it's happening, we're living in a world where no one's safe. I mean, you have Rand Paul mowing his lawn at his house and he gets tackled by his neighbor and gets his bones broken up. No, what you're not safe. You have to get over it. Like you said, and I think you talked about that in our day of reckoning, you were talking about normalcy bias. You have to get over this thing where you think nothing's ever going to happen to you because stuff is going to happen to you. And if you're unaware, you be, you're the best victim. Yeah. It, it, you know, and that's where, that's where whatever training you do and that's what, and, and that panic, panic sets in on people when an event occurs it could be a really small event it could be an event where it, just with your family and there's a medical emergency you ever, it's always interesting you really get to see who people are when stuff goes down mm -hmm. um like i always knew or my friends when i was in marine corps it'd be a bar fight breakout right it was one of the guys in the group and we always had we always had this thing like one goes we all go right no one gets left mm -hmm. and so if one guy fights we're all fighting mm -hmm. And then you, you, the, one, the one guy who wouldn't, it kind of says who he is. Mm -hmm. And but you kind of get you get to size up people when an event happens. So you have a medical emergency, you might have one person screaming and panicking and freaking. Other person gets calm and they start to address the situation. They just seem to. Some people get calm when things happen. Yes. And but but panic though tends to set in though for people when they aren't they know they're not prepared. And whenever there is a if there ever is a big scale event that would that that could occur. The people that panic will eventually realize, like, oh shit, I'm not ready for this. Mm -hmm. How am I going to take care of myself? Yeah, big, big brother, government's not going to come and help me. And then they panic. And those are the people, the people that will take to the street, cause mayhem, cause just discontent, and you know, just go crazy. And um, but while well, other people that are more prepared minded will pull back let, the more that they've gathered resources, and they'll sit back and watch people just rip themselves apart. Yeah. You know, I think that's that's like I, I said already, that's what I like about your book. That's what I like about Day of Reckoning. And I think it's the kind of thing that it's not just for, good for the guys like us, for people out there who enjoy um, books, you should try to get them to listen to it. You know, they may not they may not be too happy about that at first, but I think once the wheels start turning in your brain and you realize that what you're seeing, this is not super fantasy stuff. You know, these are things that could happen. Yeah, the the, yeah. Yeah, I, the the attacks that happened to the civilians in Day of Reckoning, that's actually more frightening to me mm -hmm. than the than the the what the military guys were dealing with. And yeah. you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to provide any spoilers. Yeah, to me neither. Wants to enjoy yeah, the book. yeah. Um, I, I'm I am I'm chomping that's, at that's the tough, bit. That's tough. I'm chomping at the bit to that's talk about horrific. it. Yeah, yeah. That stuff's horrific. By yeah, way. and a, a real true threat, and it's horrific to think about. And it, it, I think about it all the time. Well, let's look at Every the reality. This, we have a lot yeah. of things in America that are soft targets and they're wide open and people don't want to do anything about it. Schools, it's the, churches, I, I you know, there's all kinds of things that are just wide well, open. We've, we've, had, we've had a school shooting before. When, when, when is it? I mean, I've literally, and again, I don't want to talk about it because I hate to give people ideas. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is frightening that we've got more, you got more security at like a Tiffany jewelry store at the mall. You didn't have it any any elementary school, and that's shocking to me. I mean, we, we consider our children to be priceless, but yet we don't protect them. Well, it's real. So here in Gainesville, you know, Gainesville has the University of Florida, and then recently we had um, this guy that's labeled as a white suprem supremacist. Uh, I forget his name right now. Um, someone will probably remind me. But anyway, so he came to speak at University of Florida, right? And they went and spent, I think they dropped a half a million dollars in security for this guy. So yeah. th that makes, that doesn't make any kind of sense to me. If, you know, I think he has the right to speak. I, I believe that people, that we should let people speak like that. But who, who's telling you to provide security for him? You know, let him come, let him talk. And, um, you know, 
let whatever's going to happen happen as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying have no security, but you you know, you would drop half a million dollars for a guy that wants to come and speak, then I think it, in this case they only let people in who were protesting him. They didn't let anyone in there that wanted to um Oh, uh, Richard Spencer. Yeah, they didn't let anyone in there that just wanted to hear like whether this guy's a white supremac supremacist or where he's coming from or anything like that. They drop a half a million dollars for security for that whole thing, get everyone all worked up. Meanwhile, the university itself is wide open. You know, the university itself is wide open. Um, you know, the schools in Gainesville are wide open. Yeah, it's mainly that the, the the lower the elementary middle school that terrifies me. Yeah, because you know you're on a college campus. I imagine where college kids can kind of handle themselves in some ways, um, but it just that that whole thing it terrifies me because I have I have elementary school age kids and that stuff truly truly terrifies. Yeah, it's I think for any you're talking about the softest target and here here you've got a city that can drop half a million dollars. How much of that could be spent to provide security for elementary schools is so some yeah. person doesn't go and create mayhem there. Well, and you think it can't happen, but it happened in Russia. It's happened in Russia several oh, it, times. You've had attacks here in the school. It's happened. Like, yeah. You've had it attacks. Happened. Yeah, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, and I know it, it's, it truly, and I've said it, I'll say it again. It terrifies me. Yeah. I, I think it's only a matter of when it happens again on a large scale. It's, and I'm going to be the person that I told you so, because, and it's, and there's no excuse for it. I, I, they always want to come back and have this, after the event, they want it out. They want to fix it after, and their fix is always going to ban guns. It's nothing to do with that. Why don't you make sure that they're adequately protected? Yeah. And it's always the elites. It's the elites that are always – it's the celebrities and the elites. Already protected anyway. They have yeah, their kids go to good schools, yeah. They go to good schools which have security and protection. They work in offices that in order to get through to them, you have to go through a magnometer, and they have security, and they have you know law enforcement there on hand, backup you know uh, teams – they, but no, but they, they can't go in our elementary schools, can't have any protection at all. It yeah, just really think, goes to show you what they truly, really care about. They talk about caring for, you know, protecting, but they truly don't. They, yeah. There's always, there's an edge, because if they truly did, they'd be proactive about it, not reactive. Yeah. Well, and the thing, the terrible thing about it is you have lots of guys like yourself. I think you're in, uh, you're in San Diego, right? You're in California. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, my condolences <laughs> <laughs> to you I mean, on that. I'm sure, day, I'm sure you have family God, ties. Every day. Every yeah. day. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and my wife does every day. I mean, I lived in Idaho for seven years before we came back here. And I, I could go back to Idaho, live in the mountains, you know, tomorrow. And um, I, keep, I keep hammering away, keep niching away at it. So I um, love to move to Texas, actually. Listen, people in America should be able to live whatever they want. This is America, man. We've got the Second Amendment. It doesn't stop at any border of America, you know, of, of the border of any state within America, right? We have the well, Second that's why, Amendment. I, that, that's why, you know, and you know, Paul Ryan is just dragging his feet, you know, why we can't, what, this this concealed, that concealed uh, reciprocity bill should have been passed. That should have been, that's easy pickings, low-hanging fruit for them to do. Yeah, and he they, never does. He, ne he never did it. They didn't he doesn't want to care. Do it. Yeah, they. I think they were waiting for excuses no. not to do it. But the thing I'm saying to you is, you're at, you're in San Diego, right? You are a former Marine, Marine guy. You know about yeah. guns. You're a good guy. They can background check you, and they can say just like this guy in Texas that was out there willing to put his life on the line. They can background check you, give you some more training, and all that kind of stuff, and you you can become one of the people that can defend your kid's school. Or, or someone I, else's kids. School, I right? think that's a great idea. And the thing is, I think if you put that kind of stuff to a vote, I think I think I truly believe most Americans are reasonable people. I think what we hear when we hear the way the mainstream media tends to form form kind of the narrative is that this is what most Americans want, and I, it's actually not. When you, when you really look at guns and Americans view gun control. They're, they want access to firearms. They want firearms. They believe in the Second Amendment. It's ingrained in our culture. Again, that's a cultural thing. And it, it's, it's, we wouldn't have had the founding of our nation if it weren't for that. We wouldn't have had the, the kind of conquering of the Wild West if it wasn't for that. And so, it, it, you know, the ownership of a firearm, you know, separates us as a people. Australians I meet, they're all, they always hammer us for that. I'm like, 
Yeah, until the day you have a despot takeover, then what are you going to do? And they think, oh, that'll never happen. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. what the hell is going to stop history, that? <laughs> complete history shows us that stuff can happen. I mean, look at Russia today. Um, everyone thought it was the greatest thing. The Iron Curtain comes down. The Soviet Union falls apart. Boris Yeltsin or whatever his name is gets in there. It, Russia's turning into some kind of a republic, and this is all wonderful. And, and look at it now. It's become like an oligarchy. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, couple, and it happened in just a couple of decades. Uh, yeah, a couple of things in there. First of all, I'm not saying Trump's a despot, but a lot of these people who were saying that nonsense, they also thought Trump was never going to be president. Anyone could be president in America. And the day when you think like Obama is the worst president, you can get another president that you think is terrible, right? And you mm -hmm. can think Trump's the worst president. And then the next president could be really, really, he could be way worse than that. It can always get worse. I don't know why people think like, oh, this is as bad as it could get. It can always get worse than it is, you know, and you well, want I, this mechanism where you're able to resist and, and, and defend yourself against your government. Well, that, that's how I always laugh and be like, well, I'm you hear, you hear the politicians and people I've talked to, like, you know, the second, I mean, I'm, I'm for people hunting and, and, and going on sport and sports shooting. Like, it has nothing to do with that. It has yeah. nothing to do with that. No, I don't think so. It, it's all about it's all about so we can we can rise up against a tyrannical government. Yeah, that that's what it that's what it was created for. Is the Second Amendment isn't about hunting or sports shooting. Yeah. It's about it's about giving the people the means to resist armed resistance, and then always be like, how well, you we would never be able to survive against the military. It's like, oh well, for one thing, <laughs> if something like that were to happen, I did I just because I spent six years in the Marine Corps, I don't see every Marine taking the street and kicking in doors. I think you would have a major problem in the military. I think the military would fracture at that. Point. Absolutely, you have know, people yeah. like you have people like uh, I'm not doing that. No, not happening. Not and so you'd have the military would start to come apart, and not every and, and not every person in law enforcement is going to be going in and kicking doors in either. And, and just so you would have, you would have. There's just you know patriotic, you know, God fearing Americans that are in law enforcement, EMS, in the military, and they would never go on and do anything like that. They just no. and 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 so yeah. I mean, anyway, so if we had somebody that had some kind of a dic dictatorship kind of take over, it, it's it's not as cut and dry as all of a sudden every person, every person in law enforcement and every person in the military becomes some jackbooted thug. This is not gonna yeah. happen. And also just because the military may have the better weapons doesn't mean that they could stop us. Yeah, a lot of us may die. I would rather die than ever be a slave. So that's something that people don't understand. Like, I don't get it why there's so many black people or people of color that are against uh, guns or say that they, I don't think they're really against guns. They're just going along with something that they just don't even understand because I'm never planning on being a slave to anyone, right? And I'm not talking about yeah. whatever kind of slavery we had in the past here in America. I'm from the Caribbean. We had that kind of slavery there as well. I'm not planning on being that or any kind of slave to anyone or anything or any government. So I would rather die. I would rather my children die than, than that happen. So, you know, that doesn't mean that, that because they have the better weapons or whatever, doesn't mean that they're going to win. No, and you're absolutely right. And, uh, it, you know, the, the, the Second Amendment stands itself apart in that it, it gives us equal footing in a lot of ways, and it gives us the means to resist tyranny. Yeah. Um, the founders are so wise, to, you know, and, you know, if you look at the founding and you look at the history of it, and when, when, the, when they were, you know, drafting the, con the, the Constitution, thank God for those, thank God for those anti-federalists that really pushed hard because had they not pushed hard, and again, it's just like now, we've got to resist these efforts they're trying yeah. to do. And those people really want to say, listen, I know you're in, I know during the time when they were drafting the Constitution, those anti-federalists came up and said, no, 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 hold on. There's nothing in here that guarantees you can't eventually do what you're saying you won't do. And because the Constitution is written to limit the government. Right? Yeah. Now, now the laws are written by the Congress to limit people. It's yeah. the, the opposite's happened, right? Right. And thank God the Bill of Rights was created because it stopped it stopped them in a lot of their encroachment on our rights. And the thing is, they think that they can draft something to take a right. They have no means to take a right. There is nothing at all that gives them the power to take a right away. Rights yeah. are God given; they're natural rights. Yeah. They're not. They're not determined by the whim of a bureaucrat or a government anywhere. Those are God-given natural rights that preceded government. Yeah, if They've you're if you're alive, been. if you're born, if you're a human being, 
You have that right. Um, someone's yeah, asking. You have that right. Yeah, I think Mr. Vegas says, which brings up the question: Do you have kids? I think he's asking both of us. We both have. I have kids. You have kids, right? Yeah. 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 I have kids. Yeah. yeah mine are uh, teenagers. I have seventeen and eighteen year old. So. Um, so you know, how, how are the teen years? Oh, uh, it's uh, <laughs> good and bad. I think <laughs> I think it might be. Uh, it's things have switched, so it's probably better for me. Like you know, you've got girls, right? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I'm enjoying them now because yeah. I'm living in the now, not thinking about 10 years from now. Yeah. And <laughs> girls have totally changed nowadays, not, not necessarily for the for the better. Like I, I find like the girls that my sons have to deal with are outrageous. Like how when we were kids, because you were born in the 70s, so was I. When we were kids, it was the boys you had to, you know, who were really rowdy and all that kind of stuff. So now it's the girls and, you know, it's maybe switched around a little bit. So we have to deal with that. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go to some more questions. Did you want to say something? Yeah, you know, it's, you know, having girls, I feel really blessed to have have my two girls, and mm -hmm. um, I've definitely been training them and and equipping them with um, a mindset and with skill sets, so they won't be victims yeah. of things. You hear about all these these you know the Weinstein stories and all that kind of stuff and and all that stuff that's out and it exists it, it it absolutely exists there are oh, there are it. men that there are men that, that go out there and they prey upon women it happens yeah. i mean men were, were were built differently we're physically stronger and we can dominate a woman for the most part yeah. and not say they prey always on women and children they prey on women oh, yeah. and children yeah. absolutely oh, yeah. kevin spacey those, stuff what a yeah those are the what demons those are the demons that walk among us man and you know, you absolutely. And the the ironic thing about Hollywood yeah. is they're always out there talking all this shit, you know, and talking like girl <laughs> power and all that bullshit. And then they're getting totally raped and abused by Harvey Weinstein. But it was cool for a long time because he was supporting Hillary Clinton and all that. So it was all good. And they were letting all this bullshit, uh, you know, go on in Hollywood. Yeah. And this, we haven't even scraped the surface of what's coming out here with Kevin Spacey and Harvey Weinstein. I mean, there's some horrible things that if we really wow. dug into this, you know, I know there was there was rumors about, um, hold on, I'm gonna pull this up right now. I think there were rumors out there about, uh, I'm forgetting the, the the guy that has like uh, tiger blood or whatever, I forgot that, oh man. I'm oh, sorry. Well, I, um... What is that actor? Um, oh, Charlie Sheen. Yeah, Charlie Sheen. I'm gonna, yeah. I was having a brain for it. Though. Yeah, there's stuff about Charlie Sheen out there that he sexually assaulted uh, Corey Haim or something like that, which that would be, who knows what the hell is going on. But there's a, there's a lot more crazy stuff out there, you know? Yeah. It, that's why, I, for me, it's important to make sure that, you know, my girls will grow to be young women, that they they know not to tolerate stuff and to fight back. I feel the same way about bullies. There's there's all this talk you hear about in schools that zero 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 violence, you know they, they zero, zero tolerance. tolerance zero, yeah. I'm sorry, zero tolerance for violence. I'm like, you know, violence actually has a purpose. Yeah, kick a bully. And, ass. It, <laughs> no, and, and, and there's again, there, there's this there's this kind of wanting to brainwash children to be subservient mm -hmm. to listen always. And the fact is, there is a time and place when violence absolutely should be exercised yourself in mm -hmm. order to protect your family uh, and and to teach to teach a child to be a, a victim and then their only recourse is to run sometimes you can't run sometimes no. you have to fight and yeah. and and that's why I think it's important to teach them how to fight that to, to give them the mindset to and I, I you know like I remember there's a there was a special needs kid at our school we have a, on Thursdays we have this running club at our school and I go there every Thursdays and I, I run with the girls and they have some special needs kids and they were out there on the track and it's awesome to see these kids out there, you know, just trying to do whatever they can. And, um, uh, my daughter mentioned that one of this, one, one, one little girl had been picked on by somebody. I'm like, just so you know, that the hop fan, we don't tolerate that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you see anybody ever, ever bullying somebody, you know, you, 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 it's, I had, I'm totally fine with you going up and interjecting yourself in that situation. If it, if someone's bullying one of these little special needs kids, you need to Kick stop that ass. stuff right away. Yeah, man. I, and I told him, I said, listen, if you get suspended for punching, I'll take you out and get ice cream every night of your suspension. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, we don't tolerate that stuff. I mean, it, it, when it comes to I mean, people that have special needs, like they weren't, 
they they didn't ask to be born the way they were. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just life just kind of just showed up for them. And so, mm -hmm. as a society, we need to protect those people. And I, I feel really dearly about that. When I said, "Don't," I said, "I, I said, you, I, you ever see that? You kick that person's ass. Yeah. So you throat punch them." <laughs> Some people, the only way they learn is from getting the ass kicked. I'm just telling well, you. Well, right that's now. why bullies bullies get away with stuff because yeah. no one stands up to them. Just yeah. Fucking, so yeah, um, yeah. I, my and my wife's on board with that too. We both say no. Any bullies, you take them out. Yeah, I always told my kids: someone puts their hands on you, you you know, you let them. They need to pay for that. That's the way I look at it. Look, you know, it, it's I, I'm gonna go to. We've got some more questions and comments and stuff like that, but. If you look at this thing in New York, I have relatives that live in New York, people in my family, my immediate family that live in New York. And if you look at this thing that happened in New York with the guy that rented the, um, you know, he rented the, uh, the the Home Depot. I think it was a Home Depot truck, right? Yeah. And he yeah. drove down this thing, killing the, the – uh, he did this for some time. And he went after multiple people on bicycles. Think about New York, man. You cannot walk around in New York easily and be armed. You can't defend yourself in New York. You're making yourself a victim. I think this is one of the themes of your of the book of your book, um, A Day of Reckoning, that you're making yourself a victim, and then you're surprised that people are like, oh, you know where's a good place to go kick their asses? America. Because I think like back in the '80s, if you want to know something, the movies and stuff like that that came out of America, like uh, Red Dawn, everyone was like, oh, these Americans, you can go over there, they'll kill you. They're cowboys. They got guns. Now they're seeing like, oh, these guys are just suckers. They're just punks. Well, you, we could go to New York City, rent a freaking U-Haul truck or a Home Depot truck, and just drive through and just kill a whole bunch of people on bicycles. And in New York City, they can't do anything about it. The cops, the cops showed up, and they were shooting at that guy, and still didn't kill his ass. Yeah, it, you know, and and the the and I love the men in blue. My dad was, uh, you know, law enforcement retired. My brother was as well, and. Most of the time, police are responding and reacting to a situation. So they're usually minutes sometimes behind. And the carnage is they're usually just drawing lines around mm -hmm. bodies by that. Yeah. So that's why I, I think there needs to be kind of this, you know, with the Weinstein thing, there needs to be kind of a refocus on um, uh, kind of like bringing back the age of chivalry again. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having men, and by the way, that's something men need to come, men need to start standing up and holding other men accountable. Yeah. You know, we kind of live in this age of kind of we don't want to judge people. It's like, you know, I think I'm about to move past that shit. Yeah, like, yeah, we need to start that. holding we need to start holding people accountable. Like if you're yeah. you're acting out a certain way, well, get, we're going to come together and hold you accountable. You can't. You're not going to treat women like that. Women women are to be cherished and and, and revered and held up, and we're not going to tolerate that stuff. And again, that's kind of a refocusing kind of on a warrior code. You know that we about how men should act. Yeah. And, then, and then as far as like the terrorism stuff, people need to start realizing and getting trained. It's, and we need to be more self-reliant that way. We, we need yeah. to have the ability to, that everyone, well, I don't care if shit, you're in New York, Chicago, and in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. You need to have the means and the ability to take care of yourself because law enforcement is just not going to be there. You cannot give your responsibility for your face safety and your family safety over to somebody else. Yeah. That is not their ultimately responsibility. In fact, that's why you can't sue law enforcement. You can't sue them for not showing up on time. It's not ultimately not their responsibility no. to protect you. Absolutely not. And like you said, it's, it's, it's highly it's unlikely to happen. An yeah, and I also agree with you that we need to respect women. Of course we do. At the same time, I think women also need to, to reevaluate what they're doing. Because I think like in this thing that happened in Hollywood, you see these women who are out there talking all this badassery, and then they're letting these things happen. And if you're going to let that happen for fame and money, well, you know, you're going to have to rethink some of these things. So I'm, I'm not saying that what happened is right. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's right. But what I'm trying to say to you that they have to reevaluate because those women attack men like us who believe in chivalry and believe that we should be defending our families and, 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 and the women that we care about in our lives, right? They attack us because mm -hmm. of what we believe. And then at the same time, they let this guy do these horrible things to them. And then now we're supposed to feel sorry for them. And so what I think is that, you know, they also need to like, uh, you know, have a coming to God moment about what happened here and rethink all this crap that they're, that they're spouting in Hollywood. 
Well, the, the, the irony of is, remember when Pence came out, Vice President Pence came out and mentioned that he doesn't go to, he does never goes to a private dinner with just him and another woman. He always wants to make sure there's other people there or his wife or his wife mm -hmm. is in attendance. And everyone was making fun of him in the late night shows and Hollywood was mocking him that he can't be alone with another woman. When here, what he's trying to do is be respectful and make sure Absolutely. there's never a situation. And he gets mocked for that by the same people who knew Weinstein was doing all this stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say to I you. Know, yeah, it's like, really? It's like, so wait a minute. He's trying to be respectful. He's trying to make sure that there's never a situation that occurs. And you think that's that rises to the level of mockery? Right. But yet you turn a blind eye to this guy over here. And then all of a sudden you want to cry victim. I, it's like, I think what Pence was doing is honorable. Yeah. I also think a bunch yeah. of these women that stuff happened to them are the women who were marching against Trump and all that. And I'd like to see what they're doing about this shit now. You know, yeah, what, it, what are they going to do about it now? And I think part of it is they need to reevaluate their belief system. Seriously. You know, well, it, it's it, you, by the way, you do see this on both sides of the fence. It's, um, and, and it can be predictable. Like when something happens, you almost can kind of predict how people are going to react. And that's why people need to live by more by to be more principled. You know, if mm -hmm. um, you know, if 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 say if say Trump ends up doing something that's Clintonian, this we actually need then need to hold him accountable. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've I've come down on sense. Trump. I've come down it, on him. Yeah, because, because then yeah. because then we, we end up being hypocrites like the left is right now on this whole issue. They're absolute hypocrites right now, and then they, and they know they are, and um and so we need to become more principled on all these these things. But there, there's all this talk on the left about toxic masculinity and attacking men and attacking men. And what, what they're what they what how they define as to toxic mas mas masculinity is us. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, they need to. I know they, they I need know. to it's teach like, women that a dude who pretends, who goes out and goes to benefits and supports politicians that look all politically correct, and he looks all innocent and awesome, and you go, oh, that guy's a liberal. He's a Democrat. He's and then he does that stuff right in in the light of day and then at night he's doing this evil shit that's that's the problem right there and they have to stop believing in that instead of looking at people like us that we put it right out there who we are and what we do and what we believe in and we live it every day and then we're somehow the evil bad guys you know we're somehow the sellouts the the betrayers or the we're the problem in society i think they have to get over that you know i think they have their their whole mindset is what and there's lots of dudes out there you know there's lots of guys now that are like they're feminists that's what this guy was this guy is like the poster child for that that he was pretending to be this feminist and you know um and, and meanwhile, he, he it's really like, it's like a sci-fi book, right? Because he was like a vampire or, or, or a werewolf or something like that. He was pretending to be one thing and he was a completely different thing and, and uh, attacking these people. And then they're allowing it, you know, yeah, and they're yeah. bolstering it up. Just just go back to like the Academy Awards or something. It was a totally different deal, including with, with Kevin Spacey. Oh, it, well, there's, that's, that's the thing. The Kevin Spacey thing is... Um... His, his is now dealing with children. And, you know, you don't hear much about that in the media. They don't, it's, and that's what's so disgusting in a lot of ways is he was preying upon, you know, young men, you know, teenage, 14 year olds and things like that. And it's, it barely gets a, they just don't want to discuss it. And that's because these are their heroes. It's shocking. These, I, yeah. These are their heroes. But they can't, but what I don't, what I don't understand is they, they can't, I mean, I've always appreciated him as an actor. You know, I knew his kind of belief system, but he never was really hardcore about them in some ways. Yeah. Like some actors are out there and just go crazy. But, you know, uh, I've always usual, appreciated I, I, yeah. it. Yeah, Usual it, Suspects was a great movie to me. I don't think I can look at it anymore. And I've also no. always known that Kevin Spacey is gay. Oh, uh, I've always known that too. Yeah, I, I don't I think, have a think, problem with that. I think everybody knew that. Yeah. yeah it, I, this I, stuff I, is disgusting. <laughs> you know. I, I know. I, there was like, we were somewhere and my, my wife's like, well, maybe we should rent Baby Driver. It's like, it's got Kevin Spacey in it. I'm not watching that. Yeah, that guy's disgusting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've never, you know, it's it's obvious that Kevin Spacey's gay. You know, I don't have any issue with that. Um, I always thought he was a good actor, but you know, I'm not really surprised. And this is the thing that we have to change in America, where in America we are the bad guys. You know, this guy, um, I forgot the name of the guy in Houston, but you know, 
the media is going to try to make him out to be a bad guy. They try to make people like us out to be bad guys. We don't want to hurt anyone. We want to help people, but we're the bad guys. So Lola says, I got to answer some questions here before we go, because we've been doing like more than two hours here. So let me, let me hit up some questions. Um, Imposter says, what happens to Rich Brennan? He wants to ask you that. What happens to Rich Brennan? So he's actually read the book. I'm, I'm taking it then. So uh, it's up for you to figure out. There will not be a book to a day of reckoning. It's a, it's a single book. Um, it focuses on the day of reckoning itself. Oh, wait, wait. You're saying there is no the book to? That's definite? I mean I, I mean, I guess maybe, possibly, but no. I mean, that's I mean, that's why this my latest book is Driver 8. Whole different book. Oh. So, okay, that's um, kinda, I, you know, yeah, I, I, the, the concept was it's basically about the lead up to that day and all the things that happen. And <laughs> I leave you as the reader wondering in which direction you think it can go. Yeah. And you, you know how it ends. And so yeah. you're kind of wondering, no, I was thinking it would is, be sequel. I was thinking it's sequel, but okay. yeah. But I, by the way, I, just just so you know, from like the inside the writer's den, I'm in my office, right? Inside the writer's den, do I have an outline for the book? Yes. Have I written a little bit on it for a sequel? I have. I I just decided to not pursue it because I've had some other projects I wanted to get out there. Driver Eight is one that I think is a really badass book. It's kind of in the vein of um, Mad Max meets Book of Eli meets The Road. So if anyone's kind of familiar with those three kind of classic apocalyptic kind of movies and books, we'll appreciate that. It uh, takes place 19 years after a nuclear holocaust. That's Driver 8. Oh, okay, yes, absolutely. And that's out now, right? But, yeah, that's out right now, yeah. Oh, is it on audiobook yet? Well, audio is audio's in production with Guy Williams as the voice talent. Oh, okay, cool. That's is so a, a, a different. That's different than uh, yeah. Joe 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 uh, Joe Morton was the voice talent right. for Day of Reckoning. Okay, cool. Um, so Dan Davis says uh, happy birthday. Um, is it your birthday? I don't think so. Yeah, it's my birthday. Who is he saying? Oh, happy yeah. birthday. Okay, he's saying happy birthday to two four two Marine Corps. Yeah, Marine Corps. Yeah. Two four two simplify. Yeah, Marine. two more days. Yeah, two more days. Yes. Uh, so happy birthday to the Marine Corps. Um, what are you doing for it since you're a Marine? What right. am I doing for the Marine Corps yeah, birthday? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm uh, just going to be working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, my, all my friends that were in, we were in the, the suck together. We kind of just banter back and forth, send texts to each other. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the kind of guy to go in and change my Facebook profile and all that stuff. Like, it's like, I love the Marine hey, you're, Corps. You're book. writing Marines into it. your book, so I mean, you know. pretty much all my books have Marine Corps, the Marines present in my books. Yeah. I mean, I pay tribute to to the Marine Corps heavily in all my books. I love the Corps. I absolutely love it. I didn't love it as much to stay in the past six years. Uh -huh. Marine Corps. It, it, yeah. It yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. On this side, <laughs> do you love it more than when you were on the inside? <laughs> Oh man, you know, I'm it's sure like, you loved it when you were on the inside. I'm not saying you did it, but it probably I looks did. a you lot know, it's more like a love, any, anyone, yeah, anyone that anyone, you know, when, when you're in, it's kind of like it's like once you get in, you know, you can't wait to get out. And once you get out, you can't wait to get back in. It's kind of those. It's it's kind of a weird thing. Um, but there's lots of times I I think about the Marine Corps almost daily. You know, the experiences I had in it. I mean, it was a it was a great six years, man. I traveled around the world. You know, travel to exotic lands, meet interesting people, drink their beer, shoot them. Yeah. It's awesome. You know what? I seem to have more friends um, than usual that in all the services that were in the Marines. And I have to say, you guys are batshit crazy, but cool. At the same time. It's like a cool kind of batshit crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> well, you know how it is. You ever heard there's actually only two branches of the military, right? Have you heard about this? Oh, boy. So you've got, you've got, the, you've got the Army, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And you've got the Navy. And then you've got the Air Force as a corporation. And the Marine Corps is a cult. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a lot. And of, that's Marine, a, Marine like all that stuff, you know. Um, yeah, that's a lot more tame than what I thought Marine, you were gonna say. But okay. No, but, but Marines. Marines like to be. I mean, that's. It's always fun, like to to kind of play around. Marines like to be. You know, we are crayon eaters. You know, window lickers. You know, grunts. I mean, we we kind of like all those monikers. And there was an article that was written that said. Um, I should share it. I should share it again. But it was a classic article written by a guy who did who did a bunch of research on all the different militaries, and it talks about how the and he was trying. He was like a Huffington Post writer or something. He was he was trying to write 
meaning way that in all his research he did on all the branches that the Marine Corps trained killers. <laughs> they trained Marines to be okay. killers. Right. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what we're for. But the way he was, the, his tone and the way he was trying to make it out is that's a bad thing. Like, they just train mindless killers in the Marine Corps. Yeah. They have these mottos. They talk about, you know, killing and blood and, you know. And it was like, yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I, I was like, oh, I like that. That's ex yeah. And when I showed up, all my Marines, I was like, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. I think, like, from my understanding of it, and I was never in the service, um, every Marine better be able to kill people. <laughs> Right, but that, but that you know, yeah, and that you know, that once once you get into the fleet, once you get out outside of you know, uh, recruit training and pasture schooling, you know, definitely then the Marines are, kind of do divide themselves in some ways yeah. between you know infantry and everybody else. <laughs> yeah, so you know you're getting some hate. Like uh, I don't know if I should read read all the hate, but uh, Brian, am I? Yeah, Brian Quick says Navy guys party harder. But Vanessa Kitty <laughs> says I should let you know my first job in the USAF was. Before I finish as a health inspector, um, no picking on the Air Force. We fly your butt and dump you out around the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots of friends who are in the Air Force and the Navy. I've got friends who are still in there. Lola's brother. Oh, I, I, I love everybody. I just like busting everyone's balls, man. I yeah. think it's always fun too. So yeah, but, yeah. But so. I'm sorry, but the Air Force is a corporation. Sorry. Yeah. You guys don't actually constitute as military. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> to their opinion, you can find him on gmichaelhoff.com, also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you really want to get him, go to Twitter that he doesn't like, and that's where you flame him. Flame him on Twitter. They yeah, you can flame me there, and I'll respond in like a week. Yeah. No, so. if you get a if you get a, a <laughs> mega shit ton of flaming on Twitter, you're gonna have to go over there. So, oh, yeah, and go okay. flame him on uh, the Marine Corps birthday. Be, he'll enjoy that. <laughs> I so, will, actually. I, I love it all. It's all good. It's all good yeah, fun. Absolutely. So, okay, this is going to be my final question. Um, what's your? Uh, what do you do when you're not writing? Your favorite pastime? Oh, um, I, I'm really a big family guy. I know it sounds great. I, I try to spend – I work a lot, by the way. I work constantly. So when I'm not, um, I like to spend time with my family. I know it sounds corny, but I do. They're, they're my everything. Yeah. Okay. Active with my kids at school. So, I mean, the, my school's close by, so I, I definitely spend time over there. And then um, I've been getting my uh, youngest into running a lot, trying to get her to go. She does a couple extracurricular outside of school running clubs, and I take her to those, and I actually participate with her and getting her ready for her first 5K. And so I'm very, very active in their lives. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I don't know why there's an asterisk in UFC wrestling here. Yeah. I don't know what that has. I don't know why Lola put that there. Um, I don't know if someone commented about it, but maybe they just wanted to. You're not into wrestling, right? No, I'm really. I love you. I like to watch UFC, though. Oh, you do? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you do yeah, like I, the UFC and actually, stuff. I do like the UFC, and I actually got my, like, the last um, the last fight that was on the other night. Um, but I actually might have my daughters watch it, too. They like it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> They're, they're nine and eight. I told somebody, he's like, you let your daughters watch UFC? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's wrong with it? They really enjoy it. Yeah. They really like it. Um, the Armed Kentuckian says he's friends with an author that you know. So I don't know who. He doesn't say who it is. Tell us who it is before, um, you know, now there's like a whole conversation going on about uh, the different uh, branches. So we knew. <laughs> of course. Yeah, we knew we were going to get that started. <laughs> Yeah. So here, so here's what we should do right now. Um, let, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to plug whatever stuff you have to plug uh, before before I like do my ending comment here. So, um, yeah. Well, I just would encourage. I know we were talking about Day of Reckoning a lot, and uh, I would encourage people to definitely go out and you know check out Day of Reckoning. You heard a lot about it, to, you know, tonight uh, on the show. So definitely check yeah, that. Very out. Very good book. I enjoyed um, that. Yeah. Yeah, to those that are interested in the very first book um, in my actual series, the best-selling series I have with Penguin, the first book in that is The End. This is the one about EMP. Okay, um, and is that – I think someone asked us earlier, and I forgot to ask the question, like what book should they start with, The End? This is the first one in the New World series. It's a seven-book series. This is the one I – this is the bestseller. Uh, this is the one, again, it's with Penguin Random House. Um, this is the one they should pick up. They can get it at any Barnes & Noble. Um, they store uh, online at Barnes & Noble, online at Amazon. They get autographed copies from me directly. Website at gmichaelhop.com. And then my latest book uh, they can check out is Driver 8. Again, it's more of a classical post-apocalyptic 
uh, takes place 19 years after a nuclear holocaust. Okay. Again, it's like a Mad Max meets Book of Eli kind of story. Right, and so, so from, uh, what, and from I, what I was reading, it's kind of like um, in that society, everyone has different uh, jobs that are allocated to them. And this- It's kind of like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's a driver, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So he's kind of like a Mad Maxy kind of driver. Okay, awesome, awesome. And so there's got to be some cool vehicles in there. Yeah. There, well, and I have him and again. This will this will start everyone. This this will get everyone fired up. I have him driving a. Um, of course, this is 19 years, so he's taking a Ford Raptor, and he's got that all souped up and armored up. So again, I'm sure I'll hear from Chevy fans right now. Here we go. Cue it up. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. A Ford Raptor survived. Okay, hold on a second. Let me because you know I'm I'm into cars. Uh, which Ford Raptor is it? Is it a V8 Ford Raptor or the V6, uh, V6 Turbo? V6. V6. Oh. So you're saying the That's V6 survived the apocalypse? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Dude, it's fiction. That's, that's yeah, not, that's no, not getting too carried away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I know, but the minute the minute I was going to mention Ford, <laughs> there, there comes the Toyota people and the Chevy people yeah. and the GM and stuff. Yeah, I like all cars. I like all cars, and the Raptor's pretty awesome. So it's I have a couple I have a couple friends that have them, and you know I used to, I, I I did have a pickup truck a few years ago. It was a Chevy though. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually have okay. and uh, Silverado Z Z seventy four crew cab. Okay, um, yeah, I drive a Jeep uh, Wrangler now. Oh, you have a Wrangler? Yeah, I was going to ask you what kind of cars you're into now. So uh, you have the Wrangler, so that you can like, is it an apocalyptic yeah. thing? You can get out of Dodge. Yeah. Okay. I got a big old lift kit on it, big thirty sixes on it. So oh, nice. Okay, you need to. Um, if you've got a picture on Instagram or something, you got to tag me. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Awesome. I want to see what that looks like. Do you know what uh, Angry American has? He has a gigantic, it's like a Ford truck, isn't it? Yeah, it's it? like some kind of black. It's like a monster truck. Yeah, it's like some kind of special. <laughs> it's Hold on. I have a picture of what the thing is, but it's like a black ops. Is it? it I think it's black ops. Is it it's like a Ford 250 or Ford? Yeah, it's an F250. It's a 250? Yeah, 250. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, it's yeah. all lifted. Crew cab. It's got a lift kit on it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And his license plate says Angry American. It's, I think it says, yeah, I think it says Angry American or something like that. However, you can say it here. So it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool truck, you know. And he's got know, lots of equipment of in there. Do you have Do you have a whole bunch of bug out stuff already in your Jeep? I, I have a few things in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, okay. I have to keep it parked on the street so I don't keep all my stuff in oh, there all the time. Oh so. yeah. Okay. I forgot. You're You're living in San Diego, so yeah, that's got to be in the house. Okay. Um. And the armed Kentuckian says he was referring to Burt Walker. Yeah, I've heard of Burt. Yeah. Yeah, canine. I guess canine plague is one of one of the books or something that he wrote. I was just chatting with uh, with Bert the other night. He he sent me a message on Facebook, and so he and I were uh, he uh, he had he had he had, a, he, had a, he had a critique about driver aid, and so he he re he referenced me in a in a personal message, and he, he and I were bantering back and forth. Yeah, I know Bert. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so by the way, so that goes back to if anyone wants to send me an email, but just go on Facebook, message me. I, I'm, I respond to every message and post I get, you know, within reason, you know, within time. I definitely like to keep in touch. I think it's important to um, everyone that's kind of reading the books and likes the books. I'm always open to hearing everyone's ideas and stuff too. So, Absolutely. Awesome. I, well, I think you're doing a great job. I'm going to try to dig into more of the books. And of course, we'd like to have you back, man, because you've been a great guest. So well, I pre I'd love to come back. So maybe I'll have yeah. another book come out soon. Absolutely. And, you know, you don't have to just come back for the books. If there's things going on in politics, things about guns and stuff like that, that you want to talk about, you want to get something off your chest, something you're mad about, you know, <laughs> always feel free to get in touch with us. You know, you could jump on and uh, get it off, you know, uh, where, jump on, jump on the chat and start, start yeah. pontificating. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We, we love that kind of stuff. OK, so we'll be happy to have you on. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about before I uh, end up? No, I'm good. I'm good. I just want to thank uh, you and Lola for this. This is awesome. I really appreciate you having me on the show. You've got a great, great thing you're doing here. So I applaud you, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And once again, a shout out to Jacob. Okay. From, uh, you know, Leviathan group. That's how we got together here. You know, that's who made the connection. So Jacob is a good guy. I, I, and I want to thank him for, uh, you know, hooking all of this up. And like I told you, man, I'm, this is really my uh, passion. And when I started doing the YouTube thing, I wanted to make sure that I built some kind of social media so that when in the future I do my, I, I actually get my stories out there. I have a way, you know, an audience or something to, uh, 
to reflect those things off of. So, you know, I'm going to take your advice and just write something. Just write. And then once you get, once you get to that point, then just get a hold of me, get a hold of Chris, but get a hold of me. I, I, I love helping or mentoring people through the product. I mean, I could share with you kind of the, have you give you access to my team of people mm -hmm. and all that and just run with it. But um, I, when, however I can help you, I can kind of show you how to get, how to set up all the platforms. If you end up going the self publishing route, it's, you know, cause what it is, we, we, we only know what we don't know. Right. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really easy to do it. You just have to, and once you, once I could show you how to do it, then it makes, Oh, it makes it's easy then. It's simple. Yeah. So yeah. And in that light, when it gets, it, oh, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'll I'll let you finish. Oh yeah. So um, I'm I'm trying to set up a date to go out and do some shooting at uh, at Eric's place in Georgia soon. Oh okay. I be I be eighty eight eighty eight. Yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me know I'm, and I'll drive up there. Yeah, I'm I'm working with uh with them and I've talked been talking with Brandy and so I'm looking at uh, putting a date together soon maybe probably after Thanksgiving but before Christmas so like early you know December sometime I'm or maybe mid somewhere in that range heading out there doing a couple of days doing some filming on up some stuff. Oh yeah, um, Eric will help you blow up some stuff <laughs> oh, with powder for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's his favorite subject. Okay, yeah, let me know and I will come up there. And then also, you know, for anyone who's listening to this that's interested in writing and stuff like that, you know, we should put together some kind of panel maybe because I think it's a good idea to get more writers like us and people to think like us out there putting their creative stuff. I agree. I, I can put, I'll put you in contact with some other, some other people. They're all, that we're all kind of like-minded people and, get, and I can get, mm -hmm. and I know Chris can too. So I can put together whenever you, you select a date, I can start working on a group of guys and, and girls that we okay. can get together. Just have to tell me the number of people it gets too mm -hmm. big. Then it gets, yeah, it's just too much, you yeah. know, but um, I can put together half a dozen maybe writers. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we should do that. All right. So I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone that uh, we've got lots of good comments and questions and folks hanging out with us. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you guys. I want to thank everyone that supports me on Patreon, on Patreon slash Hank Strange, as well as the folks that sponsor the Hank Strange situation. That will be Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, um, Safety Harbor Firearms, and of course, Big Daddy Guns. So I want to remind you guys that tomorrow we're actually not going to be here, right, Lola? Because we are doing, what is that, like a blue jeans and cowboy? Reagan, blue jeans and black tie. It's a, Ron, okay, Ronald Reagan, blue, blue jeans, jeans and black, and black tie, tie thing. Barbecue. Yeah, we're helping like raise, there's a, the Big Daddy Guns guys are helping raise uh, money for the Republican Party here in Gainesville. So there's an event, I think we've got like Judge Janine. Judge Janine Carroll. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and cool. we've got um, Nick Adams, I think. Nick Adams, author. Yeah, yeah, we got some some dignitaries are going to be there, including Chris Weatherman. So if anyone is in Gainesville and you want to see all these cool people, you just need to look that up or hit me up on social media, and we'll tell you how to do that. And then I'll be there making trouble. Yeah, nice. causing trouble. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it. I want to thank everyone for watching. Please hold. Just stay right there, Michael. Uh, we're going to end it right now. Thanks a lot, guys. Peace out. We are out of here.